If you gave him a standing ovation, he'd be up here forever. <laughs> so would I. <laughs> I'm Tom, and I'm an alcoholic, and I'm going to feel trapped by this thing, but, but we'll see what we can do. Something about Charleston, every time I come down here, I, my stomach starts doing things. Y'all remember last time I was down here, and it was a stomach? And, uh, my doctor, my old doctor, told me when I quit drinking, I used to go with him with all kinds of troubles. I had a bad case of hypochondria when I when I first got sober. Any of y'all had that yet? I felt parts of my body I hadn't felt in a long time. I mean, really, and they hurt, you know? And I went to see my doctor, uh, Bill, you know, and, and uh, he'd sit back and smile while I told him my troubles. And he was so caring and, you know, concerned and, and loving because he would say to me, I told you if you ever quit drinking, you was going to fall apart. <laughs> and uh, I guess I'm still falling apart in some sense. But if I have to leave and go to the bathroom, you know, bear with me. Uh, stomach's kind of churning. It's either Charleston water or, or stress or tension, and who cares? It's just there. And, uh, and we, some of you were out there last night at, uh, at Baker Hospital. Mm, okay. That's good. How many of you are alcoholic out there? Let me see your hands. Okay. And how many addicts? Okay. And you know what I call them. How many pigs? That means you drink everything too thin to chew and you've chewed the re or shot the rest of it. Uh, cross addicts, they call them. I was, there was a kid down in Columbia, South Carolina, not long ago, and this kid couldn't have been over 17 years old. And, and when I talk with groups of patients, I ask them to introduce themselves. And we got to this kid, and I thought he was never going to get through introducing himself. You know, he was alcoholic, he was addict, he was bulimic, he was, an he, he was everything. And I just stood there until the kid finished, and I said, son, why don't you save yourself some breath and just say you're a damn mess or something when it comes your turn, because he had everything. I think some of us do that uh, sometimes in order to brag, you know? Old friend of mine in AA says that when he comes around AA now, he, he, uh, he, he goes to a meeting, and there's more andas than there are AA members. And uh, there I go with it right there. <laughs> but, uh, but we're all uh, people who are in... A, process of spiritual growth. And I want to talk probably mainly today about spiritual, spirituality, spiritual growth, what it is, I think, and what it isn't, I think, and kind of look at uh, the, the latter steps of the program. You know, we, we, we talk about the uh, uh, first five steps of the program and the first nine steps of the program, you know, endlessly it seems, sometimes, and, and I wonder about what the old-timers used to call the maintenance steps, steps 10 and 11 and 12. They're very important steps, and I want to get into those things uh, today with you also. Pretty much going to wing it, as I usually do, because <clears throat> it goes better that way, but I do want to share with you some points of view, not from the point of, uh, of convincing you that I'm right, you see? Not from the point of view of, of, of your believing like I believe, but I want to share some opinions and some points of view of mine with you in hopes that it will touch something in you, get something going in you. So I really don't care if you agree with what I say or disagree with what I say. That's not the point. If it begins some kind of process of thinking about what we really are and what we're really after and what we're really all about and what our addiction was to begin with, then I've probably achieved my purpose. Just want to spring something. I generally put it, I want to wind up the rubber bands in your, in your head and get them turning. And let's see if we can't do that. Any of you familiar with a, uh, a mystic by the name of Meister Eckhart? You are? I've been reading a little book of his meditations, and, uh, and it's, he's a very interesting kind of a person. Um, there's a line in his book that, that I like, uh, several lines, as a matter of fact, uh, one line is that when you pray, if you have said thank you, that will suffice. I like that. That's simplicity itself. But the line I want to share with you this morning is this. He says, the soul does not grow by addition, but by subtraction. The soul does not grow by addition, but by subtraction. Some of you have heard me talk before, and you've heard me talk about my kids. you heard me talk about my son, uh, Jason. And he's a big fella now. He's uh, God, he's about as tall as I am, and he'll be 20 years old. It's hard to remember, hard to believe that he'll be 20 years old come October because I remember when he was walking out of his diapers up the driveway, you know. Kid had a real knack for walking out of his diapers. Never miss a step. 
And he's a beautiful kid. He would say things to me like, uh, when I woke him up one morning, son, did you rest well? He'd say, yes, sir, all but my brain. My brain, he says, just never stops. A kid that sat on his potty chair and said to me, uh, Jesus turns the power on. He said that to me one day, just out of the clear blue sky. Scared me to death, you know? And uh, kids are powerful. Kids are open channels. Kids are, if you will, I believe, closer to the source than many of us are. One of my goals in life is to be a child. That's one of my goals in life, to be a child. A gentleman was asking me today, by the way, he said, you mentioned Sanford last night. Are you talking about your senator from North Carolina? I said, no, I'm talking about Fred Sanford on Sanford and Son. He's one of my role models. <laughs> you know, he, he and Wiley Coyote. You know, I, I, Wiley has perseverance. And that's what a lot of alcoholics need. He's never going to catch the roadrunner, but he doesn't know it. He's going to keep on trying. Anyway, I'm sitting there with my, my son. I forget what age he was. And I had become a little wary of the questions that he would ask me because more and more often I was having to say, I don't know. And we're sitting on the couch one night. I remember sitting on the couch, that part of it. And he says to me, Dad, Father. And I said, well, how are we going to work that out? And he said, it's simple. He said, I'll grow up and be the father. You grow down and be the son. My son said, grow down. Meister Eckhart says, the soul does not grow by addition, but by subtraction. One of the spiritual teachers who walked the face of the earth put it very clearly to us in these words. Unless you become as a little child, he told this guy, you cannot enter this state of being that I've been talking about. Growing down. It's interesting, isn't it? We usually think of growing up. But we're talking about in the spiritual life a process that involves growing down, growing to be more childlike, more trusting, more honest. Honest in the sense of being what you are. Kids know how to do that real good. You ever notice that? They know how to be what they are. There's no sham. There's no hypocrisy. They're really up front. Getting back to that state of being, I think, has to do with spiritual growth. Subtracting, if you will. Subtracting what? A lot of self-centeredness. A lot of ego. The old timers in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, when they were framing the 12 steps, learned from William James about spiritual experience and spiritual awakening. And with James, there were two elements in all spiritual experience. And he studied them and wrote a book about them called The Varieties of Religious Experiences. That's what he called them. And he said two elements are common to all. And the first element of every spiritual experience, said James, is ego deflation at depth. That's where we got our idea of bottom. Okay? Ego deflation at depth. The ego just flattens out. The person says, I can't, I give up, I surrender. And the other part of the spiritual uh, awakening or experience, according to James, was when this happens, when the ego flattens out, something else inside knows precisely and exactly where to turn and does so, usually with a cry, God help me. Have you had this experience? Have you been in a life-threatening situation and all the stops are out, you know? And you believe that you're an agnostic uh, and you believe that you're atheist and you believe all the stops are out. And, and we don't cry for our mothers or our fathers and we don't try to act grown up. But like a child does, automatically, spontaneously, we call out for the Father. It's a beautiful thing. And kids are closer to that, I think. And we want to become childlike. At least that is my belief. Spirituality is an interesting thing. Uh, we talk about it a lot. I know or knew a lot less about it than I think I know now when I got here. And I don't know a lot about it now. And maybe that's a good thing. We live in a strange world. Have you noticed that? I, I, was, I was talking to... Uh, uh, Pepper last night. I was down in Columbia, South Carolina not long ago, and there's this uh, van out there, and, and it uh, says fireworks. Okay? 
And I'm driving along, and it's van says firework. But there's a sign out front. It's one of those lit signs that you roll in on rollers, you know, and it says, Jesus is Lord, discount fireworks. <laughs> this is a strange world. Okay? Now, go into the waffle shop and have a cup of coffee, and there's a sign up there, and it says, and listen to this, shoes and shirts must be worn to be served. Have you thought about that? <laughs> It's a weird place we live in. You know that? People play games. Some of the darndest games I've ever seen in my life are played in the name of getting at the truth. Don't let me get off on politics. I, you know, I try not to get off on that. You have to get off to even talk about politics, <laughs> I think. But, you know, it's, it's a strange place. But it's a wonderful place. It's changed. Our view of, the, of, of man has changed. Have you noticed that? When you were studying history, you were studying philosophy, we used to look upon ourselves from what I call a bird's eye view. You know? We were at least uh, a combination of body, mind, and spirit. At least that. And somewhere along the line, this began to change. And we began to look at ourselves as, uh, from what I call a worm's eye view. You know, we were body and mind. Gradually, even the mind's been reduced to brain. This organ that sits up here and fires off chemical neurotransmitters and carries messages and handles all these impulses, this marvelous mechanism, which in my belief is almost totally spiritual, has been reduced to brain. world changed, or our view of it changed a lot. Y'all ever get nostalgic? You really? You know, I was talking last night, and y'all heard me, I was talking about that little mill village that I was born in. And uh, I, I love that place. Uh, everybody on that side of the street was family. Do you understand what I'm saying? We didn't have the same name, but everybody on the side of that street was family. I knew what family was. I knew what extended family was. You know? On this side of me lived uh, uh, Bill Sewell and his brother George and their, their sister, Haffy. Has anybody ever heard a name Haffy on a girl? <laughs> It's a nice name, Happy Sewell. That was her name. Lived right next door to us. And they had, their mother was named Lena. And she's a big, heavyset lady. You know, and talked rather loud. And on the left side of me lived uh, Eula Beard and Q Beard, her husband, who, who had been off, off to prison, you know, and had been back and ran the local theater. And he was kind of sinister, but he kept pony, and he gave his son an alligator for his birthday. And, <laughs> you know. And, Q, and it was John Q., his son, and, and Mike, their son, and Julie Vaughn, the sister, and on down was Martha Lucas, and on down was Betty Royal, you know? And everybody was family. Bill Sewell, he's a trip. Bill was an explorer, right? Had to explore everything. Bill didn't like to bathe. Every time Lena would try to put Bill in the bathtub, if she turned her head, Bill would escape. Okay? And Bill was a dark-skinned little boy with curly hair, you know, just a just pretty little old boy. Had the prettiest little ass you ever saw. He did, because every time his mother would escape and his mom would come out on the porch, Big Alina, Tommy, he's loose again. And there goes that ass down the street. Bill's running down, down to Clay Hill where we all played, this big pile of clay is what it was. And I had to go catch Bill Sewell and bring him home so he could get his bath. You know? And there was the neighborhood pony, Beauty. Sweet, gentle old pony. All of us rode beauty. It was beauty that I decided after seeing Lash LaRue one Saturday, I was going to leap on a horse. <laughs> Any of you guys ever leap on a horse from the top of the garage? I never did it but once. I knew then that Lash LaRue had a stunt man. Either that or he had no testicles. I didn't know which, but I never leapt on a horse again. But you got to try everything once. <laughs> My mother would spank Bill Sue when he did something. <coughs> Eula Beard would correct me when I did something wrong. And if she was wrong, she and my mama would fight. You know what I mean? Do you know I miss that? 
I do. I remember old man Lucas. He had a wooden wheelbarrow. Any of some of y'all probably never saw a wooden wheelbarrow, handmade, right? Old metal wheel, wire wheel up front of. And old man Lucas had come by the house, and he's on the way to the hog pen. You know, we had a hog pen down there in Irwin, back down by the creek. And Mr. Lucas would stop out in front of the house, and he would holler, and, and I'd come out and jump in the wheelbarrow with the hog slop. You know, he had his buckets of hog slop, and he'd ride me down, he'd talk to me all the way down to the hog pen. And he'd slop the hogs, that's what they called it, and I'd go over to the creek and catch crawdads and think. Y'all, I miss that. I work at a place now, it's a, oh, it's a gorgeous place, up in the mountains in Asheville, North Carolina. And it was built as a luxury hotel, you know, for the very rich back at the turn of the century. And it's now a hospital, and they got an alcohol and drug treatment center in it. It's just one of those just really pretty buildings, you know, old and pretty, nice design, architecture, good. <coughs> and they had an elevator in it that was as old as the building, I believe. Didn't work very well. And one of those with the old handle on it, you know, that you push to go up and down, had the cutest little old lady named Joe that ran that elevator. And Joe always tell me about her children, her grandchildren. Every time I get on the elevator, she told me about them a hundred times. <coughs> always had pictures to show me of her grandchildren. I like Joe. And her husband's named Fred, and he's a little shorter than her, you know, with a brush haircut. A little man with a brush haircut. Used to love rubbing my hand across his head. And his back was always hurting was Fred, you know. And I love to hear him complain about his back. Y'all know people like that? They, I mean, you hear the same thing out of them, but these people have got character, and that elevator had character. And they got rid of it. Reason? It was old. We do the same thing in our society, don't we? We get rid of old things. Cars, people. And they replaced it with a sterile... Stainless steel box. Thing goes beep. Then you get up to your floor and it goes beep. I don't know if any elevator salesman here. It's probably a perfectly good <laughs> elevator, but it's broken down a lot. And it's missing two things, Fred and Joe. And character. I ride down the road sometimes. Am I weird? I think these beautiful dead trees, you know, like this. God, it's got character. Me and Lisa look. I say, look at that one. You know, I get chill bumps when I see these things. And these huge, huge, and Charlotte's got a lot of big old oak trees in it, hundreds of years old, you know. You know, them suckers got roots probably that reach from here to the back of this auditorium. God, they're gorgeous. They got character. We still got some roads in North Carolina got character. Go just like this. You know? They were made to fit the countryside. You remember that? We went around the mountains. I came down here on the interstate. Interstates are sterile. They bore me. It's fun. You get there fast. And fast is premium quality, isn't it? But I don't find any character on the interstate except when I see a dead tree. Do you? I had a doctor in that mill village. I'm going to give away my age here, you know. Dr. Parker. He knew every part of my body. Knew every part of my mama's body. He delivered me. My, my daddy, he probably knew half of the town's bodies. When I broke my arm, he put a cast on it. and He let me come see him every day if I wanted to, just so I could be proud of my cast, you know. And I had a dentist down at Dr. Woodall, and I'd go to him and love to go to the dentist when I was a kid. Hate to go now, love to go then. He made plaster Paris uh, seven dwarf figures for you when you went to him. And they were hand-painted, y'all, hand-painted figures. Man, I had Snow White, Grumpy, I had all the seven dwarfs. Beautiful man. He's grinning all the time, you know, and he was happy, and, and he gave me these things when I went to him. I like that man. I have a good doctor now. His name's Tom. He's a good doctor. He's a family practitioner. They're beginning to come back, you know. But Tom doesn't treat all the parts of my bodies. You know, he, he, he sends me to somebody else. You know? You got a stomach problem, you go to a gastroenterologist. Isn't that what they call them? What a name. You know? Uh, <laughs> you got a alignment, you ladies? 
Go to your gynecologist. <laughs> Rear end, proctologist. Love it. Love that term. Proctologist. One of the founders, one of the co-founders of AA was a proctologist. You know that? Dr. Bob was a proctologist. Old timers tell me he had fingers that long. <laughs> That's right. They do. They say, point that long finger. What do you mean that long finger? He's a proctologist. He was. Great big old fingers on the sucker. Long and wire, you know. And I love Tom. He's, he's, a, he's really a fine doctor. But I go to all these doctors, and it's like I'm a sum of many parts, and but nobody knows what the total is. You ever get that feeling? And, and nobody really knows what the other one's doing. Sometimes you have to ask one of these docs, well, I'm taking this medication and this medication. Will this conflict with you? You have to ask them. I miss Dr. Parker. As quality medicine goes, as we know it today, you know, probably he wasn't even a very good doctor, but he was. And one thing Dr. Parker had was character. If he didn't have anything else, he had character. And I miss it. I like jazz. Anybody like jazz? Now, I'm going to make some of you jazz fans probably a little irritated here by what I say, but I'm going to say it anyway. I was raised on uh, Miles Davis and Jerry Mulligan and Charlie Mingus, Dave Brubeck. Some of you never heard of that if you don't know jazz, but these are good mainstream jazz musicians, okay? Charlie Parker, Thelonious Monk. I love that. My wife's got a teddy bear named Thelonious Monk. I named him. And uh, I listen to a PBS station when I'm traveling because that's the only place you can get jazz now. And they come in on top of Miles Davis with uh, this, uh, what they call contemporary jazz. Any of y'all like that? I, I guess it's okay. But to me, it's, it's not spontaneous. And there's no improvisation. And it's all electronic. And it bores me. And it's redundant. It's <coughs> gibberish. And I keep bitching about it. I can't use any other term. And Lisa says, write the people a letter. I am writing them a letter. Maybe I just like to bitch about it. But, I, you know, this jazz had character. Had character. Love it when they take off on a theme and everybody goes in their own direction, but somehow they get... I love gospel music. My daddy's families were gospel singers. I sang gospel music when I was drunk. That's right, on the radio. And in person, drunk. A lot of gospel singers are drunk. That surprise you? Shouldn't. My Uncle Johnny never had a music lesson in his life. One of those that was automatic. You know, when he sat down to the piano one day and boom, 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 there he came. He played gospel piano. Have you ever heard a real good gospel piano player like Ray Charles? Huh? Play the old 12 bar of gospel. You ever hear that? My Uncle Johnny can fly. Beautiful. Sing that gospel music. You know? And used to, when they sang gospel music, uh, it was just a piano player. Man, now they got a drummer, an electronic bass, electronic guitar, electronic, 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 you know? I miss it. I don't know if y'all miss it or not. Maybe you don't. And I think about it some. I guess I think about it a good deal. That's just nostalgia, isn't it? Yeah, because it is. But no, because I think it points to a deeper longing in me that was there long before Dr. Parker disappeared and the elevator disappeared and Fred and Joe disappeared. <laughs> I think this nostalgia points to a deeper longing in me. I've always wanted to go somewhere. I've always felt like I was missing something. I've been searching for something since I got on the face of this earth, and I didn't know what it was. How many of you can identify with that? This sense, man, down here, something is missing. I'm serious about that. And I long for it. You know, this has been talked about for ages. Carl Jung talked about it. When he was talking about alcoholics, in a letter to Bill Wilson, Carl Jung said, to me, the alcoholic's craving for alcohol is the equivalent on a low level of the natural thirst of our being for wholeness. 
We thirsty for something. The very word alcoholic, dipsomaniac, means real thirsty. I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. Psalm has talked about it. Different way. He said, as the deer longs for those clear streams of water, so longs my soul for you, O oh God. Remember that one? That's pretty. Augustine. You've made us for yourself, dear Lord, and our souls are restless till they rest in you. Restlessness, thirst, longing. Our world's full of it. It's in our music. It's in our art. This going after something that is missing. Another way it was spoken of is in a country and western song, which is a classic. Y'all, y'all, any country and western fans out there? You know the song. What is it? Detroit City. Hmm. Old boy says, home folks think I'm big in Detroit City. From the letters that I write, they think I'm fine. By day, I make the cars. At night, I make the bars. If only they could read between the lines. I want to go home. I want to go home, he said. Lord, how I want to go home. Don't we all? Have you thought about that? One of my daddy's favorite songs was, uh, I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger traveling through this world of woe. When I sing that gospel music, you know, some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away. Yeah. In the Baptist church, we sing, coming home, coming home. Story after story about coming home. I want to go home. I miss home. Wherever home is, I want to go back there. Something is missing. I'm searching for something. I want to go home is, to me, a metaphor for spirituality. That's what it is. The longing, the thirst, the restlessness. As Dr. Silkworth said about us, Duke, in the front of that book, Alcoholics Anonymous, alcoholic is restless, irritable, and discontented unless he can once again experience the ease and comfort which come from drink. It's a very simple thing, desire to go home. Basic motivating force in every human being, I believe, is desire to go home. That's the term I'm going to use for it, or that's the terminology of the way that we're going to look at it, is that spirituality is that desire to go home. And it's real simple. But we've been awful confused about it. Have you noticed that? Why are we so confused about spirituality? Why are there so many problems with it? I think one reason is that uh, for so long, science has looked upon the <laughs> spiritual as unreal, pipe dream, <coughs> fantasy. If you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. If it doesn't, doesn't fit into natural law, forget it. It's not worth studying. It's ethereal. It's otherworldly. Let religion have it. Now, ironically, it's not so much this way anymore. A friend of mine says, if you hear a subatomic physicist talking nowadays, he sounds like a theologian. And if you hear a theologian talking, he sounds like a physicist. They're coming so close together. They're talking about invisible particles. They're talking about energy. They're talking about a force. They're talking about creation being a big bang. I don't know what that means, but they're talking about it. They're coming in contact with things like near-death experiences. They're coming face to face with real bona fide, real and bona fide now, faith healing and the role of faith in healing. They're coming face to face and, 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 and using the body's internal healing power through meditation, guided imagery and things like this. People are getting healed, getting relief from pain. No medication. It's coming. We're confused about it, too, I think, because of religion. Excuse me, y'all. 
Organized religion. Okay? I believe you can take anything good and organize it until it's dead. Let religion have it. Let them have spirituality. Let them deal with it. And what do they do? They surround it with ceremony and dogs and ritual and argument after argument after argument after argument. They take something which is very simple, basic, fundamental to every human being and organize it until it's almost dead. I mean, spiritual belongs to religion, doesn't it? You sit down and talk to an alcoholic or an addict or a person who's having living problems and you, you ask them about their spiritual life and they talk about church. There may be no connection or a very tenuous one. You know, I do a lot of talking around the country at, at, at uh, conferences and things in, in the field of alcoholism and drug addiction. And they've just begun to have sections on spirituality. They're actually having these. Do you know that? They're talking about spirituality. Never did before. Not the professionals. They talked about transference and counter-transference and personality theory, but they didn't talk about this. But guess who's talking about it? Father so-and-so, sister so-and-so. Anybody that talks about spirituality has to have the collar on backwards. Religion owns spirituality, do they not? It would seem so. I don't believe that. But it's confusing. We are indoctrinated in this society into certain religious beliefs. These may be good religious beliefs. They may not be. People are seeking shortcuts to home. Do you understand what I'm saying? And electronic evangelism is offering just that. You want to go home? No effort. No effort at all. We'll get you there. And by the way, my way is the only way. Don't listen to that other sucker. He'll tell you wrong. And these are some very convincing people, these electronic evangelists. Huh? <coughs> Some of them are gifted people. They are gifted people, charismatic people. They really are. Swagger? Huh? He is a hell of a preacher. Schuler? <laughs> Him old Jim Baker. They shake and move you. And they offer you a shortcut to where it is you always wanted to go. And spirituality is natural. And simple. And it belongs to all of us. And it's not unreal. And it's very easy to understand. Let me draw you a little diagram up here. We get confused about this too. Every one of us here knows in our heart at some place that the, the spiritual way of life has something to do, and I'm going to use the term, with a relationship with a higher power. Okay? Every one of us knows that, don't we? But listen to what the spiritual teachers said. When we talk about spirituality, we talk about getting right with God, you know, getting closer to God, improving our contact with God, etc., etc., etc. Spiritual teachers said, this is vital. It's absolutely life-giving, this relationship with a higher power. But there are conditions for having it. One of those conditions said one of the spiritual teachers who I know best because I told you last night I was raised as a Baptist. I have a terminal case of baptism, but I, at least I, I admire and respect this guy even from a non-Baptist point of view. Man had something going for him, right? Now, this, this tickles me. It doesn't tickle me. It makes me angry. Organized religion has taken this man too, you know, and turned him into something he's not. You ever go to your church and see a picture of Jesus? Perfectly coiffed hair, huh? I mean, that beard is cut just right. Hmm? Fingernails are clean. You ever notice that? Clean old clothes, man, on him. You know, usually royal robes or clean white kind of stuff. The man was a carpenter. You know that? The man lived in the days before deodorant. The man's hands were roughed. His fingernails were dirty. 
There were no unisex beauty shops to go to and get your hair cut, and he couldn't afford it anyway. Didn't even have a place to stay. And on top of that, he was a troublemaker. <laughs> he was. There's a whole song written about him. He's a troublemaker, you know? I could tell the moment that I saw him, he was nothing but the troublemaking kind, huh? His hair was much too long, and his motley group of friends had nothing but rebellion on their mind. He rejected the establishment completely. I know for sure he never held a job. He just went from town to town stirring up the young folks till they were nothing but a disrespectful mob. Sir, so rather wear his sandals and his flowers while others fought the wars that must be won. They arrested him last week and found him guilty. Hmm? And sentenced him to die, but that's no great loss. And Friday, they'll take him to a place called Calvary and nail that troublemaker to the cross. And Chris Christopherson, Jesus was a Capricorn. He ate organic foods. He believed in love and peace and never wore no shoes. Long hair, beard, and sandals, and a funky bunch of friends. Reckon we'll have to nail him up if he comes down again. <laughs> Come on, y'all. We're not talking about a wimp. You understand what I'm saying? But he's been organized to death. And the man said, you go into church to worship God. You remember you have anything against your brother or sister, you had better go straighten out with your brother or sister first. Did he not say that? We miss that, don't we? This new commandment, he said, I give you. Love God with all your heart, soul, body, and mind, I think it was, and your neighbor as yourself. Did he not say that? He really ticked people off. You know that? He really ticked people off. And he ticked off these people who were involved with what? Organized religion. That's who he ticked off. He loved it. He just pick at them. You think you got something, you know? Huh? You know? You ain't got nothing. You have missed the boat, baby. I ain't like that. <laughs> they popped this one on them one day. You know, how you gonna love God you can't see? If you can't get along with your brother and sister, they stand right there in front of you. First, he said, learn how to get along with your brother and sister. Y'all remember this from Sunday school? It began to come back to me when I realized that I didn't have a single good human relationship on the face of this earth. I didn't have a single relationship that either I didn't dominate the other person or depend on the other person. I had to control every single relationship. I didn't know how to be a friend. I didn't know how to love you. I didn't know how to let you love me. That was the hardest part. And so the spiritual teacher said, all of them, check me out. The horizontal relationship here, too, between you and me. When this, you don't have to go looking for this one. It happens. You ever had the experience? Hmm? I've had the experience with a flower, you know? Uh, and the flowers, do you? Have you ever done that? I've had the experience with a piece of music. I've had the experience with my kids. I've had the experience with Lisa. I've had the experience with friends in AA, you know? Everything's just right horizontally, and all of a sudden, whoo. And they said, when everything's right horizontally, this one comes, and right here in this intersection is what you've always been looking for. That's home. I never think the spiritual had anything to do with relationships. It has everything to do with the relationships. And when I understood that, I began to understand why the word we is used more often than any other word in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. We. That's magic. That's health. That's healing. That's spiritual. And I is the basic word of separation, you see. That's illness. And I began to understand that. And I think that I understand it a little better as I go along. And as my relationships with others improve, guess what? My relationship with the higher power improves. Seems like the more familiar and loving I am on a horizontal level, Patty, the easier it becomes to believe that even God loves me. We don't know where home is, and we don't know what it is, and we don't know how to get there. You know? And we don't even know why we want to get there. 
I, I love Chris Christopherson. I think he's one of the great poets of this century. I really do. He can't sing a lick. He tickles me when he tries to sing. You ever heard Chris, Chris try to sing? <laughs> <laughs> but he writes it, you know, and he writes it from some place, and it comes out true to me. He just hits me that way. Maybe you have people who do that for you. Yeah. And, and, and that song he wrote once about me and about you. Um, see him wasted on the sidewalk in his jacket and his jeans, wearing yesterday's misfortunes like a smile. Once he had a future full of money, love, and dreams, which he spent like they were going out of style. And he keeps right on a-changing for the better or the worse, searching for a shrine he's never found, never knowing if believing is a blessing or a curse if the going up is worth the coming down. You remember that one? He tasted good and evil in your bedrooms and your bars, and he's traded in tomorrow for today, running from his devils, Lord, and reaching for the stars and losing all he loved along the way. But if the world keeps right on changing, for the better or the worse, and all he ever gets is older and around, from the rocking of the cradle to the rolling of the hearse, the going up was worth the coming down. Hmm? He's a poet. He's a picker. He's a prophet. He's a pusher. He's a pilgrim and a preacher and a problem when he's stoned. He's a walking contradiction, partly truth and partly fiction, taking every wrong direction on his lonely way back home. There it is again. I love black gospel music. It gives me chill bumps when I hear it. You know what I mean? It's absolutely stock full of this whole idea of I want to go home. Classic, swing low, sweet chariot coming for to carry me home. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child long way from home. We hear it over and over and over and over again. I think this home that I was always looking for is really a state of being, a state of being positively related to you, me, and God. I think that's where it is, at least for me. Why do we want to go home in the first place? Can anybody tell me that? We're not satisfied with where we are? Huh? Instinct? Yeah. At any, at, at any rate, I think we, we feel incomplete. There's something missing. I, every human being, you know, and, and they have beautiful long phrases for this, this feeling of incomplete, this void, you know, this emptiness that you feel inside. Uh, it's an existential vacuum. Don't you love that? Huh? It's the distance from where you are to where you want to be. And this, there, there arises a need, you know, to fill that vacuum. And they call that... Uh, Existential despair, is that what it is? I love this terminology. I have to learn it and practice it so I can wow people with it, you know, and that be important. But why do we feel incomplete, are we? I think so. Mythology gives us a clue to it, you know, why we feel incomplete. Mythology says when we got here, each of us was a complete, total, going concern in and of himself or herself. You know that? We were it. And the gods got worried about it, says mythology, and said if we leave them like that, total and complete, they're going to be like us. We better change that situation. And they did. They cut us right in half. You remember your creation stories? All creation stories, that split occurs and we become separate, incomplete, incomplete. And so Carl Jung talks about this thirst to be whole again, to be complete again, to be all together again as spirituality, getting it back together. I felt incomplete. You've heard me describe it before as I felt like I had a big hole in the middle of me with the wind blowing through it, and it hurt. I felt it severely. Everyone, I think, knows about their incompleteness or at least feels that they're somehow incomplete, but it doesn't seem to bother some people. You ever notice that? 
or they find some quick and easy answer to it, you know? That's what we call civilians or normsies, you know? I don't understand these people. They're too healthy for me. I never understood that kind of thing. Some of us, though, feel this need severely and deeply. We're really sensitive to it. What one psychiatrist calls stimulus augmenters, we feel this emptiness, this incompleteness, and this despair more intensely. And we're grasping. We are really are thirsty for a way out of this whole deal, you know? And so we take detours. We don't take the path back home. We take detours. We detour with chemicals. We detour with sex. We detour with food. We detour with work. We detour with all kinds of things. And what makes these things so valuable? Every one of them, I submit to you, for some of us, make us feel like we're all in one piece. They create the illusion that I'm home. Alcoholics. When you were just right with the alcohol, and you feel like you were there, everything's fine with God and man. Ain't got an enemy in the world. Ain't that what we said? Get along with anybody. Sing songs. Put our arms around people we can't stand. Huh? <laughs> Go to places we wouldn't be caught dead in. Have a good time. Whole world's falling down around you. Take your needle. Shoot it. The world rebuilds itself. It's astounding. Huh? Want another detour? Fall in love. <laughs> you know, this old lady up in Charlotte, a mean old lady, been sober too long, I guess. <laughs> Says alcoholics don't fall in love, they come in heat. <laughs> I said, that's a nasty thing to say. She's right. As one who's been in heat many times, let me tell you. <laughs> it seems to be complete, doesn't it? Romance is powerful, y'all. Powerful drug. Huh? And when everything goes just right on that job, huh? Here's the illusion. It's all right now. It's wonderful. It's all together. Alcohol, the effect of it leaves, doesn't it? The effect of drugs leaves. We fall out of love quick as we fall in. You ever notice that about us? Can anybody identify with that? You don't have to be a sex addict to fall in and out of love. Oh, you got to be as a human being who's very sensitive to the fact that he ain't home and wants to go there real bad. Because every addiction on the face of this earth, in my opinion, begins in that void. Every one of them. And the void is spiritual, isn't it? And so the genesis, I'm saying to you, of every addiction, alcoholism, sex, any of them, is a spiritual kind of thing. It comes out of a spiritual emptiness, a desire to go home, Patty. I swear. Can we get off one detour and get on another one? In the book, Alcoholics Anonymous says, uh, we sought an easier, softer way. Boy, ain't that the truth. You know? We get into AA, you know, and get a little dry behind the ears and fall in love, right? Then we fall out of love, right? And we figure we can smoke a little pot on the side because it don't say nothing about pot in the big book, right? <laughs> Taking every wrong direction on our lonely way back home. And then finally, it dawns on us. You want to get home, you have to get on a path that is designed to take you home. And... If you're going to walk that path, you cannot walk that path and detour at the same time. You're going to be out there looking for a short, swift answer with your sexual life. You cannot practice the 12-step program. Do you hear me? You're going to be out there smoking dope. You cannot practice the 12-step program. You're going to be addicted to work. You cannot practice the 12-step program. You still ain't happy and you wonder why. I'm in AA. Are you? No, you've got to get on the path. And either you're on the path or you aren't. I believe that. I didn't want to believe that. Some of those detours were pleasant. I lost sight of the fact every one of them was deadly.
You've got to get on the path and stay there. You used to hear these old-timers and they talk about, say bad things about sex. You know what I mean? Tell the, tell the boys, you know, that, that under every skirt is a slip. <laughs> no hen and she in. I thought, well, hell, he's so old he's forgot what it's like anyway. <laughs> no, he didn't. And they'd follow that with first things first. And it, they, it, it didn't match. You know, they went right by one another in my head till I began to understand what they meant, you know? Priorities, 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 priorities. What are your values? Where are your values? Have you learned any patience? Can you wait? Are you still going to have that alcoholic mentality that says, I've got to feel good every minute of every day and every second of every minute, and if I don't feel good, it's not working. I've never met an addictive person that wasn't very impatient, by the way, y'all, including me. We want it now. Pleasure. Not purpose, pleasure. And then we begin to realize that maybe the pleasure comes from the purpose. If we get on the path and we walk the path and we do a little good for somebody and learn how to love somebody, really love somebody, a little pleasure comes along. That it's not the central thing. That's a bonus. What kind of path is going to take us home? And why don't all of them take us there? You know, I've wondered about that. There, there are a lot of wonderful paths. Some of y'all have heard me talk about them before. You know, the the, the uh, Ten Commandments, you know, that, that's a very stern, but if you follow those principles, you're going to get home. The Sermon on the Mount uh, or the Sermon on the Plain in the New Testament and in the Bible, those are, are paths that, that lead to home. This place that, that the... Uh, Spiritual teachers call this home heaven. That was their term, or utopia, or nirvana, you know. Uh, one Indian guy one day when I was talking said, don't forget happy hunting grounds. There's a wonderful one, okay? This is that goal that we're talking about. And, and, and there's some good ones to get there. There's some good psychologists. You know that? Some wonderful psychologists who worked out some pretty good systems which are really paths that are designed to take you home, although I don't know if any of them would admit it. Abe Maslow probably would, and Carl Rogers probably would. Okay? But there's some good psychological systems. There's some good religious systems. In other words, there are many paths that we can take that lead us home. Any of you ever had this experience? You get on one of those paths. Were any of y'all compulsive church goers? In between every two drunks? I was very compulsive about going to church and getting right with God. That's Baptist, okay, to the core. I tried that path very, very hard. I didn't play at that path. I really worked at that path. I put myself down for years on that. I seriously studied the Bible. I seriously studied the Christian path. I tried my best to walk that path because I knew it led where I wanted to go. And it did not work for me. I got on one of the psychological paths. I worked hard with a good doctor. And I knew that path was supposed to lead me home, and I tried, and it did not take me there. Why? You ever wonder that? Why won't psychiatry work for me? Why won't religion work for me? They seem to work for some people. Why not me? I think it has to do with which path you take depends upon where it is you're starting from. I had never thought of that. Which path you take and which one works depends on where you're starting from. I really believe that. Now, if you're starting from a, 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 a neurosis, okay, or a psychosis or something like that, psychological path going to take you home or in the direction of it. There's some good ones. And if you're a, your problem is deeply religious, 
One of those religious paths will take you home. The Eightfold Middle Path of Buddha, the way of Tao. They'll take you home. But if you're an alcoholic or an addict or an addictive person of any kind, your starting point is from addiction, not schizophrenia, not neurosis of the common variety. And you ain't got a religious problem per se. You're an addict. And so you start in on that 12-step path. Now, I'll tell you what, lo and behold, I have found out, and you're going to discover this if you stay clean and sober, okay? Do you know that all those paths converge? At a certain point, every good path converges with every other good path. There are certain principles that are common to every one of those paths, and I didn't know that until I got on the path of sobriety and spiritual growth and began to grow back, okay, from way out yonder somewhere to where I was supposed to be in the first place, growing down. And lo and behold, here comes people I can understand walking a different path, and here come people I can understand walking a different path. And the first thing you know, we're on different paths, but we're on the same path, and it's all coming together. It's almost like coming home. Twelve-step path works real good for addiction. It works better, I will not hesitate to say that, than anything else to ever come around. At some point on the path, some AA members would probably kill me for this, but at some point on the path it may be necessary for you to parallel your path with a psychological path. It may be necessary for you to parallel your path, you know, with a religious path. And that is your business. Okay? Just keep in mind where it is you're going. Home. Where is that? A place of relationships. With who? with others and with God. I used to hear preachers talk about uh, in Him we live and move and have our being. Did you ever hear them say that? It's a wonderful statement, isn't it? I never understood that statement. I didn't. It just sounded wonderful. I hear wonderful things. A lot of times they don't make no sense to me and all of a sudden the light goes on, you know? Uh, I believe the reverse of that is true. story told by Chuck C. out in California once, I never will forget. It's talking about these three little fishes living in the ocean, Pacific. So these three little fishes swimming around one day, playing, you know, so a big fish came swimming by. I said, hi, y'all. They said, hey. He said, isn't it a nice day? They said, yeah, it's a nice day. He said, well, isn't the water nice? And he swam off. First little fish turned to the second one and says, what's water? He said, I don't know. He turned to the third one and says, you know what water is? He said, no, I don't know either. And he said, these three little fishes swam around the Pacific Ocean for the rest of their life, searching for that in which they lived and moved and had their being. And we're told God's closer to us than our next breath, and we say, how can that be? And we're told the kingdom of heaven's right in the middle of you, and we say, how can that be? <coughs> and we go looking for it like we're looking for Easter eggs. That's natural. But we're taught by the spiritual teachers you have to seek in a different way. What you've been seeking externally, you must seek inside. That is where it is. You are the answer to what you're looking for. I'm nuts, I guess. I believe each of us that God lives and moves and has his being in us. I believe that that we are expressions of God. I really believe that. Do you realize that when you can accept that and look at that and even begin to think about that, how the question of purpose kind of comes real clear for you? Hmm? You are here and I am here to express God. And so is every created thing. And I believe that. I mean, that's heavy, isn't it? And we think, oh, bummer, got to express God, you know? Well, if you think about it that way, it's a bummer. But I believe laughing at myself and getting out there and cutting the fool and being happy and joyous and free and being serious and hugging some necks and kissing a few people and just plain old doing the best I can do today is what I'm supposed to do. 
And when I'm doing that, I'm okay. With who? With you, with me, and with God. I'm home. Now, I don't know when, you know, you get home to stay. Seems like I've visited it many times. Y'all know what I mean? I've visited it many times. And I just wonder, when am I going to get there to stay? I don't know. I really don't. But I do know that if I'm going to take this new path, I've got to get off the old. What that means to me is I've got to die, if you will, to the old path and to the old self. And I've got to take that new path. It's got to be closed. Do you understand what I'm saying? And I've got to begin a process of growth, which we call in addiction recovery. And recovery to me is a movement back home. It's a progressive series of steps that takes us right back where we started, right back to the bosom of the Almighty. Am I getting too religious for you? Sorry about that. Until we reach a point where we have what's called a spiritual awakening, which is like, good Lord, I am his kid. <laughs> it's wonderful. It is absolutely wonderful. Good God, I am. You know, even me. Terrible me. Classic story. Let me share it with you about going home. Now, I, if I were a woman, see, I'd read the Bible and I'd even read the big book and I'd say, them people are chauvinistic here. But you've got to remember when these things were written, okay? And, and there's a classic story about going home which pretty well says the way it is, okay? And all of you are familiar with it. Uh, it's called the story of the prodigal son. You remember that story? You want to hear the revised Brady version of the prodigal son? It's a wonderful story. Not from a religious point of view, from a coming home point of view, from a spiritual point of view. Now listen to this. This kid, see, evidently his father's rich. And so he goes to his father one day and he says, uh, I would like to have what is coming to me. I want to be a man. I want to run my own life. I want to get out of here off the home spread and go out and try my wings. You see? I remember one night I told my daddy, give me what is mine. I was going to be the prodigal son. I want to get out of here. And daddy looked at me and says, you wearing what is yours. <laughs> my daddy said that. That sweet man said that. You wearing what's yours. <laughs> Got to notice a lot of things as this story goes along that I didn't notice before. The father did not argue with the kid. Not one word. Oh, I don't want you to go. Oh, stay home with me. Oh, you know? Respect. It's almost equivalent with godly love. Respect. He says, here. Papa said, good luck. I love you. Kid goes off. And he detours. You understand? Into a far country. You ever been there? He said he wasted his substance in riotous living. He blew his wide, y'all. He's broke. Probably hung over. Pusher wouldn't speak to him. Bootlegger didn't want to see him, you know? Because it said there came a great famine in the land. Oh, Lord, I ain't got no booze. Great famine in the land, and no man gave unto him. You ever been there? And he says, uh, I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I got the shakes real bad. I got to get some wherewithal to take care of myself. So like you and me, he got a job. I used to get jobs just to keep temporary, long enough to get one paycheck so I could get drunk and then I'd disappear. I went to work for a Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company one day. Worked, oh, I worked about two weeks with him. I went out to lunch one day and the man didn't see me again for 10 years. <laughs> it's the God's truth. And then I was sober. He said, I always wanted to ask you, where'd you go that day? <laughs> I could have said on a long journey into a far country, you know. 
And, and this kid, and we forget this, you know, we Gentiles forget this. This is a Jewish kid they're talking about. He got him a job. You remember what his job was? Jewish boy tending hogs. And Jews and pigs don't go together. <laughs> Except one, my friend Manny Berger. He's dead now. He used to live up in Columbia. One of the finest AA members ever walked on two feet. And every time I was down there, Manny wanted to talk to me. You know, I was about the only one he'd talk to. And he'd say, come on over to the house and we'll give you a kosher ham sandwich <laughs> while we talk. Got a job tending hogs, right? He's working, but he hadn't got his first check. Evidently, it was one of those jobs where they withheld your first week's pay. I hated them. And, and he's still hungry. <laughs> and I love the Middle English language. You know, it says, he fain would eat the husk that the swine did eat. I know what they're talking about. They're talking about pig slop. The boy going to eat pig slop. And he's a Jew, and he's tending hogs. Are you ready for that? The shit done hit the fan. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's like hitting bottom, isn't it? Wonderful thing. Says he came to himself. You ever think about that in terms of the second step? He came to himself. Now think about the second step. And he said, Self, you're in the hog pen. Oh, it's all gone. Now he says, uh, Daddy's got the big spread back there. And he says, and listen, I'm not fit to be his kid anymore. But maybe he'll let me work as a servant because the servant's got plenty to eat and wear and a place to sleep. So he heads on back with his tail between his legs, you know, because he's no damn good. Well, we put off on God a lot of stuff. You know, I put off my judgment on me, on God. You ever notice how closely your self-concept relates to your God concept? If you haven't, please do. If you think you are rotten, you're going to have a punishing God. There is no other way. If you think you need judgment, you're going to have a judge for a God. And this boy went home saying, I ain't worthy of being his son. What was he looking for when he got there? What was he expecting? An angry father, right? The story says when he was a long way off, the father saw him. Sound like a judge? Sound like he's mad at the boy? Just waiting to get him? No. <laughs> and went running out. He saw him. When he's a long way off, he saw him. Went running out, hugged his neck, kissed him. Kids probably standing there mumbling, saying, I ain't worth being your boy anymore. You know, I ain't worth being your boy anymore. Punish me, punish me, punish me. Boy, we do a number on ourselves. And the father's kissing on him. Put a ring around his finger. Symbol of God's love. No beginning, no end. And God, God's love says, whatever you do, I love you. Nothing you can do is going to change that. Ever. Said, I missed you. Glad you're back. Brother came running up and uh, says, what are you making a fuss about this boy for? He'd been out there and blown his wad, you know. He's a bad boy. Father says, in effect, hush, I don't want to hear that. He said, go on back there where we keep the, uh, the fatted calf, I think they called him. That's USDA choice, y'all. That's the one for the cookout. He said, go back out there and kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a party. Your brother was dead and he's alive again. I'm happy. And that's the journey. We go out. And the father waits. We go out and we try our wings, you know. And we take some detours. And we end up in our personal pig pen. And we're hungry and we're sick and we're tired. And we're shaky. And we head on in saying to ourselves, I'm not worth two cents. And on the journey, on the path, we grow more and more and more back towards being a child of the Father until we get home 
the Father says, you're still the child. You're still it. Growing down. Coming back. I don't care how you put it. To what you were in the first place. And then trying to stay on that path. Trying to stay on it. And grow some more. And grow some more. And grow some more. You want to break for a little while? I know the smoker's about to die for a cigarette. Is it, <laughs> it's 10 minutes to, it's about 10 minutes to 12. You want to break for lunch? Duke, uh, Jerry? I'll leave it up to you, whatever you feel like. You all want to break and get some lunch? Yeah. Do you? Yeah. Okay. How long would you need? About an hour, be back here at 1 o'clock? Okay. Any questions? Sure? Have I made any of you mad? <laughs> Nobody? Huh? Okay. See, see you at 1 o'clock. I talk to professional groups sometimes, many of whom are not recovered people, and... Uh, uh, give them a pitch about how abstinence is the essence of recovery. You know, you abstain from whatever drug it is or whatever addiction it is that, that's got a hold of you, but that the quintessence, the pure form of recovery, always and ever is spiritual growth. And that you cannot maintain abstinence without growing spiritually, and you can't grow spiritually without abstaining. And so those things are intimately connected in this growth process, this business of growing down, if you will. And a lot of the growing down has to do with what William James called deflation of the ego. Uh, some people balk when you say deflate ego. That, they almost equate that word with annihilate ego, you know, uh, destroy ego. Uh, we're talking about, okay, let me put it this way, in Little Red Hen language, which is the way I understand things best, there is in me, there was and there probably always will be, a little spoiled brat that lives right inside of me about eight fingers above my navel, okay? He sits in his high chair, and he beats on it with a spoon. <laughs> and he says, do it, and do it now, and do it my way, or I will retaliate. Now, we are talking about, in recovery, if you will, turning the brat into a child who is simply sitting in his chair, not directing things, but living his life calmly and quietly, and allowing those around him to do likewise. So we're talking about getting healthy here. We're not talking about killing the kid. That's, that's a big jump. We're not talking about that. But in a certain sense, the kid dies. The kid dies. Any person who recovers has to sacrifice. And sacrifices are, that's a nice word, I guess, for deaths. You know? There's giving up to do here. And some of the things that accompanied, you know, my addiction, my drinking problem, uh, my inability to abstain, were some of these things were very precious to me. You see? Some of these things were very precious. And you have to die to those things. There is no spiritual growth, I don't believe, without a death. Seems to me for rebirth to occur, you know, there's got to be some demise somewhere. And with most of us, it's like the influence of the spoiled brat is reduced little by little, and the little kid begins to increase more and more. So it's like a balancing kind of a thing, if that makes any sense at all, okay? A balancing, a bringing down. The word anonymity, do you know the root of that word? Any Greek scholars in here? I hope not. Any Greeks? I, I use Greek words sometimes. I had a student in the class one day that was a Greek, and she said, you're wrong, and she had to straighten me out. Anonymous. Anonymity, says the Twelfth Tradition, is the spiritual foundation of all our traditions, ever reminding us to place principles before personalities. Anonymity is the greatest ego deflator on the face of the earth. That's what it's for. It says when we're outside that door out there, we're many different people, many different statuses, if you will, as society has us in, these levels of society, whatever they may be. But when we walk through that door, titles disappear. Educational status disappears. Uh, male and female even, ideally, disappear. 
uh, particular religious beliefs which we honor among each other are left outside that door. And we come in here equal. Okay? We come in here equal. Anonymity, okay? Means I'm no better than you. I'm no worse than you. In the truest sense, I am you. What happens to you happens to me. What happens to me happens to you. It is the greatest bonding mechanism on the face of the earth. And we read through those 12 traditions, and we read about anonymity, and, and many of us consider anonymity like a Band-Aid, you know, a protective covering that you put over a sore called alcoholism or addiction or of some kind. It's not. It's a leveler. It's an ego deflator. If you will take the time someday to look at all of the 12 traditions, please, from an ego deflation standpoint, you're going to see what the 12 traditions are really for. All of those 12 traditions are saying, individual, reduce the ego. Fellowship, keep the ego reduced, or we will destroy one another. It's a very important kind of process. It really is. So we're trying to take the spoon from the spoiled brat and saying, hey, kid, we love you. You know, don't tell us what to do. Settle down a little bit. And the irony of spiritual growth is that only the kid can grow that way. Only the brat can lay down his spoon. I can take it away from him, but he'll pick it up again as soon as he gets a chance. Only the brat can lay down his spoon. Now, each of us in this process of growing down are uh, carrying with us a certain attitude, a certain outlook on life. Did you know there's an addictive outlook? I believe that there is. I sit down with people. Uh, one gentleman was mentioned he was bu bulimic. I, I'm an alcoholic, but I bet that he and I could sit down and talk in terms of attitudes and outlooks and feelings and values and beliefs, and we're, we're right on. We're right on. I found my uh, detour in alcohol. He found his particular detour in, in food and in binging on it, okay? We carry with us a certain outlook, and we don't come in the world with the outlook. Now, we're talking about getting back to where we were to begin with, okay? Through a process of called rebirth, along with regeneration, being made all over again. That's the process of growing down. Rebirthing, going all over again. Each of us, deal with this thing right here. You ever stop and ask yourself, what is reality? It's a wonderful word, isn't it? We use it all the time, don't we? Daily. I love Lily Tomlin's comedy, okay? You know her character, the bag lady? Bag lady shuffling along. She knows what reality is. She turns to the audience and says, reality is a collective hunch. <laughs> and if they tell me if you get too close to it, you get all stressed out. It upsets you. I like that. A friend of mine who's a marvelous doctor, spiritual doctor out in California, reality, he says, is a, is, is a uh, or we all live according to our own personal myth he says, and if enough people agree on it, we call it reality. It's Paul Brenner. If you ever get a chance to, to read any of his stuff, uh, uh, one book he wrote called Life is a Shared Creation, another one that he wrote, uh, Health is a Question of Balance, in which he says mind-boggling things like, isn't it a shame that we never notice we have a thumb until we jam it in the door? He's a nutty doctor. He's brilliant, absolute genius. To hear him talk is a gas, I'll tell you. Okay? And uh, he became anonymous. He was the head of the female cancer service at a very large university and got bored with it and started treating people uh, with prayer and meditation. He'll spend a day or two or three days with one patient. Okay? Somebody tell me what reality is. Anybody. Nobody wants to tell me what reality is. Am I going to have to go home not knowing what reality is? <laughs> Patty, tell me what reality is. No, okay.
the way things really are and not the way you want to see them. Yeah. We what? Everybody hear that? You know, back when I was in school, uh, I, I, it taught me grammar. They always trained my left brain. You know that? Oh, my left brain really got it. Logic, grammar, arithmetic, all this kind of stuff. Reality is a subject, and is is a verb. Remember what kind of verb that is? Small English lesson here. Huh? Huh? They, used to call, they call it a linking verb now, don't they? The verb to be. And after a linking verb comes a word that describes the subject. Hmm? Yeah. Okay? Reality is now. You said you make your own reality. I agree. I agree. I fill in this blank. I could go around this room and take a secret poll, right on a piece of paper what reality is. Everybody here would have an opinion about what reality is, and some of them would miss each other by miles, and some of them would come very close together. And if we got into certain aspects of reality, they'd start coming even closer together until we got the addictive view of reality. But just for now, let's say this. Reality is for me what I see it to be. I agree with you. Reality is for me what I see it to be. I behave according to what I see, don't you? And reality or my view of it and my behavior are intimately connected. Example. This is a bad world. I was, <laughs> I was doing a group up in Asheville, North Carolina. You ever see one of these? There's not one here. I'll make sure before I say it. One of these little old ladies, and they're cute, and they got blue hair. <laughs> you know how, how they, they put that stuff on their hair, and they get it all blue and everything. She's the prettiest little thing you ever saw. Absolutely denied she was an addiction. She'd been on an addict. She'd been on Valium for 23 years, right? She could not be addicted to it because it was prescribed by her doctor. Okay, one of those. Bless her heart, I hope she's still alive. And I asked her, what is reality? And her response was, do you really want me to tell you? I said, yes, ma'am, I do. Are you sure? Yes, I do. Are you really sure you want me to tell? I almost had to pull it out. Yes, I want to hear what reality is. She said, okay. Life is a plunger, and we're all pieces of shit. <laughs> you hear that? That's the way she filled in that blank. What kind of life you think she had, Carol? God, what a bummer. You know? You think your view of reality doesn't affect your behavior? And the lady did. She had a rotten life, and she was depressed a lot, you know? And she was anxious a lot, and Valium was indicated. One of the detours. You see? I make my reality. I live according to what I see. If I see you as friend, my behavior toward you is quite different than if I see you as enemy, etc., etc., etc. And it is I who see you that way. All right? Then this brings up a question. If my behavior is so intimately related to my view of reality, who's responsible for my behavior? That one hurts, doesn't it? Me? That's right. The eminent philosopher Pogo put it very well, folks. I have found the enemy, and he is me. I form my reality. I live according to what I form there. Okay? Now, what does it tell us to? If, uh, suppose, what can I use for reality here? Let's just use this key. Now, what Lisa sees is different than, what's your name? Jerry. Jerry, than what Jerry sees. And that's different uh, than what you see in the green cap. What was your name? Phil. Yeah. Yeah. Different than what he sees. It's different from what I see. Every one of us in here sees a piece of that reality. <laughs> is that not right? Then what lesson can we learn from this? Reality is point of view. Another lesson. If I want to know more about what really is, I must relate to you. 
There is simply no way for me to find out about the fullness of life and reality, okay, without you. There's the magic word, we again. But we egomaniacs believe that our point of view is the only right point of view, and we run around trying to convince everybody else that it is because we're so afraid that it isn't. Any of you know any AA fanatics? <coughs> I was one. I know what they're like. They secretly walk on water, or try. You see? Any of you know any religious fanatics? Certainly. There are fanatics everywhere, frightened, egocentric people who are determined that their point of view must be supported by everyone else. Okay? So we need each other. Each of us is responsible for his or her own behavior. And we behave according to what we see reality to be. Are you with me so far? Now, we have widely differing viewpoints on what reality is, and yet many people share a common point of view. I ran around with a bunch of people who shared my view of reality. Did you all not do the same thing? I was admitted to a fraternity in college because ostensibly I shared their point of view. I went to the Baptist church and sat next to, next to old Miss Sims because ostensibly I shared her point of view. I fit. And I ran around with Egghead and Junk and Ducky and that bunch that I ran with, you know. Crazy names we had for each other. That's calling me Sweet Lips beside then by instead of Pudding Head, by the way. And, and uh, <laughs> I shared that point of view. Now tell me something. You run around with a drinking or drugging crowd. You share that point of view. You go into treatment or you get sober and you stay sober two weeks and you go back with that crowd and you drink again and it surprises you. Why should it surprise you? And these old uglies around the programs, they change your playgrounds, change your playmates. Well, they don't like my people. It's not that. It's that if you're going to fit, you're going to have to share that point of view. If you share that point of view, you're going to do again what you're doing before. There's no two ways about it. And boy, people differ in their points of view of reality widely. We differ in this room widely in some respects, okay? Philosophically, there are differences. About psychology, there are differences. About what human beings are and are not, there are wide differences. We know this. But certain people share common views of reality, essentially common views of reality. Did you know that? We talk about... Uh, Certain religious groups, and they share a common view, and certain philosophical groups, and they share a common view. But there are two other groups of people that share a common view of reality that I never thought of until I really got thinking about this. Healthy people and unhealthy people share a common view of reality. Any of you ever understand healthy people? I mentioned this last night. I just never understood healthy people. I didn't know how to be healthy. I had to have someone to teach me who had had to learn from somebody else, who had had to learn from somebody else. Yes, we do need one another. Let's do a little scenario here. The healthy guy. The alarm clock goes off in the morning, and he reaches over, and he cuts it off, and he sits up on the side of the bed, and he's not too happy about getting up. and You know, he's still a little little heavy-eyed and everything, but he wipes his eyes and says, oh, well, time to get up. Wish I could sleep longer, but got to go. And he's up off the bed, man. Goes in the bathroom and passes the mirror and sees his image and says, you're not the prettiest thing in the world, <clears throat> but you're not the ugliest one either. I believe you're enough. Whatever comes up today, I think you can handle it. This is the healthy person talking to himself in the mirror. I never understood that. By this time, he is singing, right? He hasn't been up 10 minutes. He's humming a little tune to himself while he, you know, begins to shave. This is a healthy person. And he's talking to himself, dialoguing. He says, uh, got to go to the office today, and you got that job to finish, and Sam's trying to, you know, get in your way here. There's always going to be somebody trying to get in your way. Don't let it bother you. Go ahead and do the best you can. It'll be all right. You're going to make mistakes today. It's okay. It's all right. Everybody makes mistakes, he says. You got problems. All of them are not going to be solved by bedtime tonight. But the unsolved ones will not keep you awake. He's humming, singing, shaving, not cutting himself, talking to himself, liking himself.
takes a shower. He's dressed. He's still humming. You know, he's having a good time. Dresses, goes to the door. His wife comes up. And he says, I love you, baby. See you tonight. Got to go, you know. He goes out to the bus of life, which is pulled up to the curb, and heads for the passenger section. You know people like that? You know? What kind of day do you think he had? I mean, he set himself up pretty good for that day, didn't he? Probably came home, had a good day. Probably sleeps good at night. I never did. How about you? Unhealthy guy. Scenario. Alarm clock goes off. He prays. Oh, shit. That's his prayer. Puts on a snooze alarm. He says, I'll sleep till it goes off. It goes off, and he hits it and prays again, right? I can sleep 15 more minutes, he said. Don't really want to get up, and he oversleeps. Wakes up, realizes he's 30 minutes late already, and he's not even out of bed, and he prays again. You got that prayer? Runs to the bathroom, sees himself in the mirror, and almost gags. You ugly. I don't think you can handle it out there today. You got to go to the office, and you got to do that job, and old Sam doesn't want you to do that job. He's going to stand in your way every chance you get, and he'll probably defeat you, and you're going to lose your job. And problems, he says. You got these problems. And he starts thinking about the problems. He's dialoguing with himself, you know, and he, he cuts himself and he prays again. And the problems kind of feed on one another, don't they? Once you let one of them have its run, the other one comes behind it. Before you know, the man hasn't even peed yet, and he's got 473 problems gone, all of them unsolvable. And he said, they're going to run wild today. You can't sleep tonight. You're not going to solve all these problems unless you can find the right solution to every single one of them. It's got to be exactly right. And don't you let anybody know you make mistakes because you're not supposed to, and they'll get you if you do. Now he's bleeding, right? And every time he cuts himself, he prays again. He's already prayed 40 or 50 times, too. See, he's not even out of the bathroom. Jerks on his clothes. They don't match. Runs to the door. His wife comes up. He says, get out the way. i got to go. Runs out the door to the bus of life, which is pulled up to his curb, and goes dead for the driver's seat. What kind of day you think he had? God, that first part of the morning is so important. Maybe that's the reason the big book Alcoholics Anonymous says when it's talking about prayer and meditation, upon awakening, not ten minutes after, upon awakening, it says, we think about the day ahead. Okay? I don't know about you, I can wait 15, 20 minutes in the morning, and I'll end up not praying and meditating. I got too many problems and I don't have time. I'm a busy fellow, y'all. Too busy to keep an appointment with God. Way too busy. And by noontime, it is flying apart. Any all that way? I know you're not, but you know. <laughs> now, where do we get this point of view? Where does it come from? Because we need to understand that. Y'all have seen me draw this old picture of the mind so many times that you're probably sick of seeing it, and it's really not your mind, but it's a pretty good model. Let's draw it here for a minute. And in the middle of the mind is that window that we look out of, and we form opinions about what we see, and we put labels on people and places and things, and that's called perception. And my perception of things is the way I see things to be, roughly. All right? Now... When I came into this world, I don't believe I had any opinions. Did you? I, I don't think little babies have any opinions. I don't think they put labels on anything. I think a little baby lives in a magic world, y'all. It's the world called we. The window that he looks out of, the perceptive window, it's clear. As a matter of fact, if he moves, something else moves. If he makes a sound, something responds. It's like everything's him, and he is everything. He's real close, you know? He begins to get out of bed at an early age. 
Oh, and I gotta say this. Ever notice a baby in his crib? Or her crib? They're always seeking to relate to something or somebody. Don't care what it is. A kid can sit in the crib and play with a leaf for hours. I believe they totally absorb that leaf. They know everything there is to know about that leaf, not intellectually, but in the deeper knowing sense. They don't even know it's a leaf. They just love it, feel it, play around with it, absorb it. But eventually they get out of that crib, you know, and they go crawling across the floor. And maybe this thing here is sitting on the floor. And he crawls into that thing, and he hits his head, and he gets this strange sensation going down right here, right? Up until now, everything has moved when he moved. That didn't move. And he, well, furthermore, he's got this strange sensation down the back of his head over here. Watch a baby. Generally, the baby will back off and hit it again. You ever watch a kid? Kids are a trip, man. They will back off and they hit that thing again. They are determined it's going to move. Everything's moved up to now. That's going to move. And it doesn't move. Now, if you want to know if that baby's going to be an addict of some kind, that's the baby that backs off and hits it seven times trying to move it. And it won't move. And he hears a voice. And the voice says, Honey, don't hit your head on the table. It will hurt. The table. This sensation... It's called hurt. I don't like that. Scenario now. Go with me. And he looks at himself and he says, God, you're small. You're so limited. You're not that table. You're not that big thing over there that made that noise that said something about hurt either. And I believe fear sets in real early. He has recognized his separateness. And he begins to say a new word that he's never said before. I. Me. Mine. If you want to test this out, go up to a baby, you know, young one who's sucking on a bottle. Man, they slobber all over everything. You know that. Babies slobber. I expect somebody to come up one day with something called slobber therapy. We've ther tried every other way, you know, but walk up toward the baby, and the baby sometimes will push that bottle out to you, slobber and all. You know that? Because you're not you. You're part of him. I mean, he's like he's feeding himself. Really. Think. But he's three years old, and you got him a sucker, and he's licking on him, right? And you walk up to him, and you say, that's a good-looking sucker. Could I please have some of that sucker? He says, it's mine. There's a radical change here, y'all. What was related is separated. <coughs> what was total and complete is now fragmented. <coughs> now, this kid begins to form a system of things that are very important to him. <coughs> system of what we call values, huh? I'll write it out here. And his values begin to impact on his outlook, on his perceptive window. His first value may be, it's important for me not to hit my head on the table because it hurts, right? Let's stay simple. He begins to form a whole system of opinions now in my life. I need filling. He'll go looking for something. He'll go looking for something that will change his view of reality. Hopefully, it'll change it instantly, y'all. You know? We like instant stuff. Go in your grocery store and look. Go to your bookstore and look at the instant books on psychotherapy and on how to get good and how to get well and all, you know, in 10 minutes and get a degree for it. We like instant stuff. Our society, I think, doesn't know how to delay gratification. I'll just say that about the whole society. 
delay gratification. That's wonderful, big language, isn't it? This society doesn't know a damn thing about eating Oreos. This society goes right for the creamy center. Never mind the wafers, baby. Let's get with it. <laughs> Listen to the street language. Let's get it on. So we find something that's instant. Maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it's food. But whatever it is, the effect of it is to change reality or to seem to change reality or your point of view of reality. The world which was a plunger changes radically, dramatically, instantaneously, feeling good. That's wonderful, isn't it? That's what they call the elixir of the gods, I guess. Uh, did I share with you last time I was down here about A.E. Houseman, the English poet? Any of you read his poetry? Nice stuff. It's really good stuff. And, and uh, Houseman was an alcoholic, I know, uh, because I read this poem of his one time, and he couldn't have written it if he wasn't. And he was talking about this change. And let me share this with you. He said, Many a peer of England brews livelier liquor than the muse, and malt does more than Milton can to justify God's ways to man. Ale, man, ales the stuff to drink for fellows whom it hurts to think. Look into the pewter pot and see the world as the world is not. Bingo. It's changed, didn't it? The major reason that I drank and used drugs and did a lot of other addictive things was that those things seemed to change reality. Seemed is an important word. They never did. Reality was always worse when I returned. Houseman said that too. Look into the pewter pot and see the world as the world is not, he said, and faith is pleasant till it is past. The mischief is it will not last. Well, I've been to Ludlow Fair and left my necktie, God knows where, and carried to my home or near pints and quarts of Ludlow beer. And then the world seemed none so bad, and I myself a sterling lad, and down in lovely muck I've lain happy till I woke again. And then I saw the morning sky. Hi-ho, the tale was all a lie. The world, it was the old world yet, and I was I, and my clothes were wet. And nothing now remained to do but begin the game anew. Tell me you wasn't a drunk. I hate to tell you this. I hate to, to discover this. Reality does not change instantly. Oh, God, how I wanted to. And how you wanted to. You come off a bender, and you'd make these world-shaking statements like, "I have learned my lesson this time." <laughs> you hear that? We really meant that. I have learned my lesson this time. We say, "I will never do this again." I am finished forever. And I got to tell you what's true of me. Any time I use the word forever, ever, or never. I'm on an ego trip. That was true then, it's true now. I have learned my lesson. I'm not going to look at it that way anymore. Now, you've been out there building that point of view of reality for how long now? Is it 20 years or 21 years or 25 years or 30 years? And after one bad experience, you're just going to change it all. There's the instant grits again. I'll just add a little water here. It'll all change instantaneously, painlessly, hopefully. Sorry about that. Your point of view of reality will never change until your values do. What are they? Abraham Maslow talked about a hierarchy of values. There's system. Patty, they're arranged in order. 
first value, second value, you know, in order of their importance. In my mind, at some level, is that value system, all of it. If I ask you, honestly now, well, if I ask me, to write down on a piece of paper your top five values, could you do it? I could probably write down, you know, what I wish they were and what I thought they were. But I doubt if I could do that. So, if we're going to change our point of view and our perception of reality, we must change our values. If we don't know what our values are, we must discover what they are. How do you do that? Look at your behavior. That hurts. That's a dead giveaway. We behave in terms of what's valuable to us. Look at your behavior. Might shake you up. But you discover what your values really are. And then when you discover, as Chuck used to say, you discard. You replace, you reprioritize. But first you've got to know what's there. And then you start moving things around a little bit. And what happens is this. Okay? Now, you will never change your perception unless you change your beliefs. Your opinions about what's right and good and true and real and all these things, your opinions about this reality thing, right? What are your beliefs? What do you believe? Do you know? Then how do you know? Look at your behavior. Discover. Discard. Reprioritize. Replace. About those feelings. Any of you ever look at the world through angry eyes? I did for 30 years. The world looks different, doesn't it? Feelings, boy, they hit. They impact so heavily on what reality is for me. Clean them up. That's what the 12-step program says. Clean them up. Learn how to express, get out these feelings. And the beauty of the 12-step program is to suggest that we get them out through service to others. If you look at it very closely. Memories? Look at your experiences in life. Instead of damning yourself for having them, learn from them. It's a beautiful section in the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. It begins by saying, now, about sex. God, we avoid that topic, don't we? And you know what that whole thing says? Look at your past behavior. See what your values were in your sexuality, huh? Because it's very closely related to spirituality. They are so intimately together that we confuse one from the other often. What's your beliefs been in your sexual life, you know? Who have you hurt in your sexual life? The whole thing is look at it, learn from it. Don't put yourself down. On this side of the paper, you know, what you did, and on this side of the paper, what you've learned that you're going to do now to change. That's the way we learn. And so you will think if you've been uh, clean and sober or involved in a 12-step program for any time at all, you know, you probably have realized by now that you learn more or have learned more from your mistakes than from your successes. And it's the transformational process that takes place there, you know? This mistake becomes the foundation, if you will, of my future success. And the big book says, our past becomes our most valuable asset. That blew my mind until I understood that. Yeah, it is. This is a transformational process that's happening here. Now... When you have examined these things, when you have learned from these things, when you've cleaned up a little bit, guess what happens to your perceptive window here? 
clear? Like a child. Unless you become as a little child. Okay? Moving on back. Clearing up the window. And start all over again. With what? These principles which are guides to progress. New priorities. Huh? The new priorities given to you in this program and these principles. It's a funny thing, y'all. The beginning phrase in the twelfth step. Anybody tell me what it is? Come on. Having had a spiritual awakening. What is that? If it's not a massive change in perception. Would you tell me? What is it? Carl Jung said it was that. Massive shift, he said, in values. Massive shift in attitudes and beliefs. Total change. Okay? So something dies. What? Old values, old beliefs, old feeling patterns. You see? And you really do start all over brand new. Now you're ready to be, if you will, regenerated. Yeah, made all over again. And we say, oh, oh, that's far out. Anybody sitting in here that's an addict or addicted to anything or is addicted to an addict even? It is strange what people get addicted to. <laughs> and, you know, your addiction hasn't killed you today. You're being regenerated. You're being transformed. If you're a dilated addict, you haven't shot up today. Something's happening to you. Yeah. If you're an alcoholic, you haven't had a drink. Something's happening to you. You see? But you see, in addition to being impatient, wanting instantaneous stuff, we want big stuff. Transform me, Lord, now. Get me on up there with Augustine. It's almost like God comes back and says, Okay, if you're ready to work and wait. It is work. It almost kills some of us. We've got to work at the program in order for it to be a success. And we balk. I'll go this far and no further. What do you mean 90 meetings in 90 days? Oh, I can go. My, my job won't let me do that. What do you mean get a sponsor? I don't want to bother anybody. <sighs> what an ego trip. <coughs> well, you worked pretty hard to become a drunk. And you work pretty hard to become addicted. And you think you're going to get over it on a slide. You think God is some large fooly bear riding across the clouds on a tricycle. I don't think so. So you got to work. Any of you familiar with a German philosopher by the name of Friedrich Nietzsche? Nietzsche fell into great disrepute, you know, because Hitler liked him. Uh, Nietzsche died in a nut house when he was 40. You know, what could he know? You ever realize some people are too tender for this world? People like Van Gogh and Nietzsche, and we've known some others, too tender for this world. And Nietzsche really took a beating because uh, you heard all the preachers a few years ago and they're yelling about God is dead and God is dead and all this stuff. And you saw the bumper stickers, if he's dead, he died since this morning because I just talked to him and all that kind of, you know, how we get carried away with stuff. Nietzsche was the man who said God is dead. 
So he's taking a beating. But they never gave Nietzsche his full due. Nietzsche did say, God is dead. His love for us has killed him. You know what else he said? He who has a why to work for can put up with any how in order to get there. If your goal is sobriety and it's strong enough and important enough to you, you'll put up with what it takes. You'll do what it takes to get there. And if it's not, you won't. Okay? Change doesn't just happen. Not real change. Only illusions. Okay? Now, I think we're going to break for just a little bit. It's about what? It's about 2 o'clock. Uh, Jerry, do you want to say something first? Okay. And let's take, I don't know, what do you all want to take? About 10, 15, come on back, and we'll go from there. I want to talk to you a little bit next about uh, uh, maintaining maintaining things in terms of uh, watching. Uh, if you don't know what that means, maybe I can tell you. All right? Six is get ready, and seven is go, and eight is get ready, and nine is go, and four is get ready, and five is go. Each is a preparation for the next. And the fifth step, and the seventh step, and the ninth step very much are a process of ego deflation. Uh, if you're going to have to do some reading to see that, okay? And every single one of those steps takes us along that horizontal plane, spiritually, towards others. Every one of them, okay? In the fifth step where we confess to another human being, okay, the exact nature of our wrongs, we're moving along. And the seventh step when we, when we ask God to remove our shortcomings, we're asking him, really, if you use the prayer in the big book, to remove the things that are standing between you and him and your fellows. Uh, and in the ninth step, you are going directly to people. And the beautiful thing about the ninth step, really, of the restitution process altogether is, is that uh, if you're familiar with the karma, the wheel of karma, are you familiar with that concept? Okay, let me give it to you briefly, okay? Karma says this. It's like you see a wheel up here, and it's going round and round, and karma says what you put on the wheel over here, exactly what you put on the wheel is coming back to you. Uh, in Christian tradition, it is stated in a different way. It's called the law of retribution. It says, what you sow, you will reap. Now, over the years of our addiction, we have sowed many seeds on that wheel of karma. And the beauty of the, the process of steps four through nine is that we get a chance to identify what it is we put on the wheel, okay, who we need to go to in order, if you will, to clean off the wheel. Yeah. We don't have to reap that which we sowed if we dig it out, okay? If we make amends, in other words, take it off the wheel. Another beautiful thing about the wheel of karma is that it works positively, too. Whatever you put on the wheel that is good will come back to you. No ifs, ands, and buts. It's a spiritual axiom, a spiritual law that it's going to happen this way. So <clears throat> these steps are a process of ego deflation. They're a process of... Uh, when they deflate the ego, they move you closer to the other. They deflate it, they move you closer to the other. Because remember, the, the ego, the I, is a conscious sense of separation from. And we want to decrease that separation from and move back into that world that the child lives in, which is called the we world. Okay? And that's what the steps are doing for us in a very large way. Now, if it said all the way throughout the big book... Uh, uh, we're doing this to deflate your ego, Tom. I probably never would have done that because I didn't understand what ego deflation was. I don't think I even knew I had one when I got there. You know? And it was so screwy and so reversed, anyway, that it would have frightened me. Any of you ever read the original manuscript of the big book? I would have never joined this outfit. You know what it said? You must do this. You must do that. You must do this. It was all you. There was no we in it. 
And at one point after the 12 steps, it says, uh, if you've read this far, and or I don't know the exact words, and are, and are not willing to go on with this, then read it again. And if you're not, then throw the book away. That's pretty aggressive, isn't it? And on the suggestion of a psychiatrist, perish the thought, <laughs> who said, this is a little harsh, a little pushy. They changed the words to we. Okay? There's magic in that word. There really is. Now, after we've completed the first nine steps of our program, I don't know what it says in the NA book, but in the AA book, it says, <clears throat> we have now entered the world of the Spirit. Strange, isn't it? We have now entered the world of the Spirit. Okay? What's that? Think. We've been dealing in the first nine steps with what? Ourselves. But what aspect of ourselves? Our past. Right? First nine steps bring us up to the world of the Spirit. N-O-W. Now. Present. Where it's all at. Now is an interesting thing. Even before I quit saying the word now, it's not now. One of my favorite philosophers is a Jewish guy, Martin Buber. And he says, now is the only point at which I shall touch eternity. It is always now. You ever thought about that? It's a beautiful thing. Now, higher power, when he spoke to Moses, and I always envied Moses, you know. Higher power said, I am. Didn't he? That means like God's present tense, I am present tense. Now is the world of the spirit. Now is the world of relation. And it goes on to say that our next step is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. Our next step is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. And we get into those maintenance steps in the program. Now I'll take a particular point of view today. Uh, and about the last two, or the, the, the tenth and eleventh steps, I'm just going to try to touch those a little bit. Just touch and get you thinking a little bit about them, okay? They're very important steps, these maintenance steps. Okay? Uh, those of you who heard me talk last night, I said that when I got to this fellowship, okay, and into the 12-step way of life, I hated me. How many of you hated you? I mean, really and truly now. Okay? In a very strong, strong way. Felt like you were an utter failure. I did. A real loser. Uh, I was the guy who, when uh, my psychiatrist asked me to describe myself, answered instantly, I am the sorriest son of a bitch in the world. Instantly. And didn't hear myself, Patty. And I wondered why my life was going consistently downhill. I wondered. It couldn't go any other way. I believe I'm rotten, I'm rotten. I'm going to behave rottenly. Matter of fact, every time everything got good in my life, I'd louse it up. If I'm not careful, I'd do the same thing these days. These God-awful beliefs that I had about myself. When you get into your belief system, look at some of those. I'm no good, I'm sorry, I'm worthless, I'm unlovable. Look for them. When you see them, admit them, accept them, change them, identify what's really there. But you can't do that unless you watch. Now, the tenth step, viewed non-religiously, but from the point of view of a spiritual teacher, do you remember when this spiritual teacher came down, he'd been up on the mountain, been doing some praying, he left his guys down there waiting for him, and he came back and they were asleep? Okay? He said two things. Watch and pray. Remember that? Watch and pray. The Greek word for watch is a beautiful thing. It's a command. Gregorite. You know what it means? And wake up. Be aware. Realize. 
Look. Watch. Then pray. Look at 10 and 11. You almost see an identical pattern there. Watch and pray. 10 step says we continue to take personal inventory when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. It's a recapitulation of several of the preceding steps, obviously. But note the terminology. In the book Alcoholics Anonymous anyway, it says we continue to watch. That's what it says. We continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. And when these crop up, not if, when, we do the following. So, we've got to move, I believe, from self-hate to self-love through watching, through self-acceptance. That's really far out, isn't it? Self-acceptance. Who, me? Accept me? I don't even like me. I've got to fight and I've got to change. And yet our program says in the preamble and how it works in the AA book, those that don't recover are those who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program, not fight anything. So we watch. Let's talk about three aspects of watching, waking up, realizing, being aware. And you know, I think it's a strange thing. A friend of mine says most of us walk around this earth for most of our lives in a state of spiritual sleep. We don't know who we are. We don't know who others are. We don't know what the world's all about and life's all about, you know. But we tell ourselves we do, which deepens the sleep. Watching. It's an interesting thing. If you believe that this world is a terrible place, Watch for one day, all day, for the good things that happen to you and for you that you don't have anything to do with. Wake up. Realize, be aware. <coughs> some of you are already thinking back through today, aren't you? Because some things have already happened. You know, I was so arrogant that when the good things happened, I just didn't even notice them. I just took them for granted. They were supposed to. Really. Oh, boy, but when the bad ones happened, I was very aware of those. Why? Because of my attitude, because of my perception of reality. I was looking at it from the left-hand side, always. And I was unaware of the good in life. I'm not saying this is a grand and glorious and wonderful world, but I'm not saying it's not. We have people who want to understand and don't understand what grace is. If you will watch for one day for the good things that happen to you and for you that you don't have anything to do with, you will begin to understand with that knowing beyond knowing what grace is. You will experience it. You will begin to look for it. You'll begin to expect it. You'll begin to count on it. And it'll happen more often. Because you're awake. You're watching. How many of you have ever done that? How many of you have ever taken an hour or two hours and watched for the good things that happen to you and for you you don't have anything to do with? We'll go to a meeting and we'll say, the most marvelous thing happened tonight. I was thinking about so-and-so, and he called me. <coughs> the most marvelous thing happened today. I was down, and I got this letter. And after we talk about it at the meeting, it's gone. And probably that day when you spotted that one thing, you spotted 500 things that were bad and missed 500 that were also good. Which side do you want to live on? I'm not talking about being a fool. I'm talking about being more positive. There's an old song. I was talking to a lady about it the other night. I think Johnny Mercer wrote the old song. It says you've got to accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative, latch on to the affirmative, and don't mess with Mr. In-Between. That's what I'm talking about, and it goes beyond positive thinking. It includes that, but it goes beyond. 
It's embracing the truth, really, that there's a God and that he or she really does care about me and that they consciously work for me 24 hours a day. Me. Else, why is it that when I've got a particular song on my mind and I really want to hear it and I go get in the car and cut on the radio, it's playing? Hmm? Why? But you gotta watch. The program is a program of spiritual awakening because we're in spiritual sleep. I believe they go together. And spiritually, you see, I take naps all the time. Don't y'all? I take naps all the time. There have been very few people throughout history that have been continually awake. And they have been so transformed that even those who loved them and lived with them did not know them. It's powerful. But you gotta watch. Got to watch some other things, too. <coughs> watch for the vultures. You know what the vultures are? Hmm? Sid Simons wrote a book on values clarification. He's probably the world's foremost authority on values clarification. He's also a very gentle and kind and beautiful guy. And he wrote a little old book called Vultures. And vultures are the put-downs that I do on myself. So why are you taking a day to watch for the good things that happen to you? Take another day. I know this is taking a lot of your time to do this, but take another day and watch for the number of times you put yourself down. That's really incredible. You want to find out if you hate yourself or not? Take a day and do this. How you really feel about yourself? We got a terrible opinion of ourselves. We are God's kids. We are expressions of God. If what I said is true, you know, I don't know. I think it is. And we treat ourselves like dirt and beggars. Prodigal son, I am not fit to be my father's kid. We really do a number on ourselves. Watch for it. You make a mistake. And you hear yourself say, profanely, so-and-so, you've never done anything right. Do any of y'all do that? Boy, that's, that's that never word again. So you know the ego's involved in there somewhere, don't you? And all you've done is make a small mistake, and you're damning yourself for it. People in transactional analysis talk about tapes that we have in us and certain things happen and the tape starts playing. It's an old reaction pattern, an old thought pattern of some kind, behavior pattern of some kind. And, and I often thought, man, it would be wonderful if you could get a new tape library, right? Called the regenerated person, right? The one who's grown down finally once and for all. Take out the old tapes and put in the new ones. Wouldn't it be wonderful? It's almost like going for the center of the Oreo, isn't it? I got to tell you something about me. If somebody made me able to get that set of tapes and play them, I would find fault with them and be bored with them in a very short time. I used to think I wanted to live on a mountaintop. I don't. I'd long for the valley. I need the ups and I need the downs. I need to take control of the driver's seat every now and again. I need to, okay? If only just to learn again that that's not my proper position in life. I need to learn and relearn and relearn. I need a tape to play over and over and over and over and over again. You understand what I'm saying? I need redundancy. I need repetitiveness. I need to go to meetings now over and over and over again and hear them say the same things over and over and over again because if I don't, I'm going to die. I need it. Be neat. New set of tapes, right? Or if, if we had a little button up here that says uh, erase. 
and a certain thing happens and the old tape kicks in, it's going to kick in. No two ways about it, it kicks in. And you can say, gotcha, erase it. Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> Can't do it. Only way I know to change an old message is to put a new one on it. And put a new one over it. And put it over it and over it and over it and over it and over it again and again and again and again and again until the new message becomes the old message. Until that thought which used to precipitate a drink or a drug or a binge now precipitates a phone call to your sponsor or a trip to a meeting. A new reaction pattern. Programming, yeah. You want to call it that? It's called living, too. You got to live your way into good thinking. That's what Grumpy told me. He's right. You got to put that new message on top of that old one until it becomes the message. And even it will probably have to be altered or changed in the passage of time. And you got to do it quickly. There's a thing about vultures. One of them lights on my arm. If I let him sit there for just a little while, before I know it, I look back, and there's a hundred of them suckers over there. Not only am I putting myself down a little bit, now, boy, my arm is loaded. Vultures attract vultures. That spiritual teacher I was talking about said it. Deal with your adversary quickly. When the vulture lights up there, when that old tape starts playing, put the new one on now. Do not wait. Get it in there. Kick it in right at the present moment. Now is the only time that we touch eternity. Don't let it sit. The friends will gather. And before you know it, you've done a number on yourself again. And if you let that happen long enough and enough of your old vultures come back, they will have both arms full, right? And they'll lift you bodily and carry you to a bar. So you watch for those put-downs, and you stop it. We're funny people. Not only do we want to be better than everybody else, we want to be worse than everybody else. You know that? Somebody tells an up story, we got to tell one better. Somebody tells a down story, we got to top that too. Strange, isn't it? Watching, it's important. Watch for the good, watch for the bad. Watch yourself. And remember when you're watching yourself, you're watching others too. Remember there's not really any division. Remember that what I put on the wheel, what I do to you comes back to me. The judgment I lay on you is the judgment that I lay on me and vice versa. It is all intimately connected. It's always been that way and it's always going to be. If I can't see anything good in you, you can bet I can't see anything good in me. Therefore, I have to feel superior. So watch yourself in this way. You make that mistake. And you say, I made that mistake. Just like that. I did it again. You know? And what our tenth step says is when these arise, we ask God at once to remove them. Notice the at once. There it is. I did it. But without condemnation. And I hope you'll help me with that. And I trust that you will. And you go on about your business. We do not change overnight. We do not change overnight. But we learn to accept ourselves exactly like we are. Exactly. 
No front, no facade. That's ego stuff. In the seventh step, you ever read the prayer in the seventh step in the big book? It says, Lord, I'm now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. Good and bad. That's an admission, isn't it? And there's some patterns that don't disappear overnight. Most of the old patterns don't disappear overnight. They keep reoccurring. The vulture lights, in other words, right? So what do you do? Damn yourself for it? Put yourself down for it? Yes, probably. Why not observe it as God would observe it? With love. Yeah. Yeah. love and concern. Even psychologists like Carl Rogers, quote, the curious paradox, said Rogers, is that the moment I accept myself just as I am, then I begin to change. End of quote. And we're fighting and condemning and kicking and screaming. I think when we ought to be accepting. And I'm saying a lot of this to me too because I have a terrible time with this. Watch yourself with love, with respect, with concern. Don't judge. Observe. And when you see it pop up, ask God's help at once. There's a mighty fine book that some of you would probably benefit from reading and probably enjoy. And it was written by a little monk. He was a cook in a monastery in Paris back in what, honey, the 17th century? 16th or 17th century. His name was Brother Lawrence. And he wrote a little book which is called The Practice of the Presence of God. He really didn't write it. It was written about him. Must be a hundred books with that title, so the, the one by Brother Lawrence is the one that you want. And this little guy had lived his life so well that he was accounted a saint. Yeah. Everybody thought Lawrence was a saint except Lawrence. He couldn't understand what all the hubbub was about. And when he was dying, they, they, they sent, the archbishop sent his, his uh, second in command down to interview him, you know. How did you become a holy man? Well, he's very surprised that they thought he was a holy man. He was a cook, and he said so, you know. And he said, well, how do you get along? Obviously, it just shows all over you how you get along with God so well to what you attribute your relationship to God. You know? He says, I think about God as often as I can, and I have a little conversation with him. That'll blow you away, won't it? He said, set times of prayer, you know, and services and everything, they bore me. I'd, I'd just rather, you know, think about God and talk to him. And he said something very important to me about self-acceptance. He said, when I'm in the kitchen and I drop a pot, he said, I will often say to God, see there, I dropped another pot. And if you don't help me, I'm always going to be dropping pots. And went on about his business. That's what I'm talking about. You see, that's what I'm talking about. You observe it, you don't judge it, you ask God's help with it, you go on about your business. Okay? Watch. Watch for the put-downs you do on yourself. Watch for the grace that surrounds you and works for you 24 hours a day. Watch yourself very closely and learn to observe, accept yourself as you believe God would accept you and you will begin to change. That's one of the messages in the program. Any questions on that? Because we usually don't look at the, the tenth step as a practice of watching, do we? And yet, that's what it is. Okay? So we wake up and we try to stay awake, y'all. We try to stay awake. And remember, the words of the twelfth step in that first, first phrase are, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. That is the only result they're talking about. That's the result. But it's kind of an all-inclusive thing. Okay, so we watch. Another way to watch, and it's suggested in our literature, is, uh, you know, at night when you go to bed, think over your day. Again, observing. 
And in our book, it says we're careful not to fall into morbid reflection. We simply, at the end of the day, as this old timer I love very much used to say, you count yourself up and you see how many you really are like that. And then you go to sleep. So at the end of the day, think about it. Some people write it. They keep a journal, you know. Not for the sake of, of keeping a black book on themselves, but for the sake of learning from their own behavior, self-observation, which patterns they need to work on and which patterns they are good at. Okay? Let's move on into the 11th step now with this prayer and meditation business. Okay? Have I ever talked to you all about this, Patty? Some? Have you all heard me talk about prayer and meditation? All of you? Because you probably don't want to if you've heard it, but uh, uh, we'll go ahead a little bit. Prayer and meditation, being as they are spiritual practices, have also tended to fall into the province of religion, have tended to become formalized, to be looked upon as uh, otherworldly kinds of activities, you know, uh, not common and natural and normal in this kind of thing. They're far out. When you say to someone, I had migraine headaches for years. Oh, he says, how did you get rid of them? And you say, I began the practice of meditation. What would his reaction be? You know, now if you had told him I took some Percodan, he'd understand that, you know, very clearly, right? But meditation? Hmm, don't know about that. But there's power there. God, there's power there. I have a friend in the program, he's, he's, I do not know how many years sober now. I mentioned him last night, Tom Powers. And Tom was vice president of the American Atheist Society. He was, literally, in his drinking days. And, and back in the 30s, uh, Tom was making quarter, half million dollars a year when it was big money. Big money, advertising man, slick, right? So every time he'd lose a job, he'd fall upstairs, get a better one. And Tom refers to himself as an asylum commuter. Because every time he'd go on a bender, he'd end up in a straitjacket. Every time. Psychotic. And he said, they'd take me to this hospital and they'd treat me. And he said, they didn't put me in with the drunks, they put me in with the jumping jacks. That's what he called. <laughs> and they treated me, right? They gave me lots of hydrotherapy, you know, things that were current in those days, and kept me in a straitjacket until I behaved a little bit. And he said, then they gave me shock treatments. Now, Tom is a genius, a bona fide genius, no doubt about it. Vice President of the American Atheist Society, big man, makes lots of money. Okay? Shock treatment in those days was not electric. They hadn't learned how to do that yet. It was a drug called metrazole. And they gave you metrazole in near lethal doses until you went unconscious, and then they held you while you convulsed. That was the shock treatment routine. In eight out of 12 of these, he had 12, series of 12 of these things, eight out of 12, he was fully conscious. He did not go out. He convulsed while five guys held him down. He kept hearing this voice did the Vice President of the American Atheist Society. And the voice was crying, God, oh God, please help me. And he realized who it was, Patty. It was him. Wonderful book he wrote, too. First title, First Questions on the Life of the Spirit. You can't find it in a bookstore. You'll have to contact. It's now called Invitation to a Great Experiment. Is Knowing God a Reality? Beautiful book. Quite a book. Any of you want to know about it, I'll give you his address or the bookstore where you can get it. It's out of print. <clears throat> Real genius, this guy. Today, this former vice president of the atheist, American Atheist Society, sober 40-some years, you know, uh, runs a place up in the mountains of New York called Eastridge. And it's a place for what he calls hopeless idiots. People like him, who are so smart, 
or so fried in the brain they can't make it in AA and NA, or those who know all the answers and can't stay clean. And they go to Eastridge, and they live, and they learn, and they stay straight. And this former Vice President of the American Atheist Society now says, prayer is an instinct. Now think about that for a minute. That it's built into us just as deeply as the cells in our body. That we need to pray. That pray, prayer is a natural process. And again, if you have a hard time accepting this, think about through that life-threatening situation that you had. There's an automatic cry, and it's always for God. The soul knows where to turn in times of trouble. I don't know why. I just know that it does. We need to pray, apparently. It is not otherworldly. It is natural. More than that, it is food. It is food for our spirit, just as the food we ate today at lunch for Quincy's, I think, was our bodies, wasn't it? It's for our bodies, maybe for our spirit, especially the uh, pineapple cake and banana pudding. We need it. It's automatic. It's instinctive. It's good. For me, it was for emergencies. Every time it was the bottom of the ninth and the count was three and two and there were two outs, I looked to the bench and there sat the greatest pinch hitter on the face of the earth. I'd say, hey, I love you. Really need you now. He'd come in, get up the plate, switch hit. Which way you want me to hit? Hit left-handed this time. Home run. Every time. And I'd say, thank you. You know, I'm going to make you a part of my regular lineup from now on. You're really hitting the ball good. And I'd send him back to the bench where he sat until the next time it was bottom of the ninth, count three and two, and two outs. Any of y'all do that? Now, that's good prayer. The emergency kind of prayer, the automatic kind of prayer, proves that prayer is a natural thing, that prayer is, as the poet said, the soul's sincere desire. It is what the soul wants to do. But it is not the kind of prayer and meditation that we're talking about in this process of regeneration, rebirth and regeneration, growing down. What we're talking about here is discipline, prayer. Any golfers in here? Who's the best golfer in the world right now, your opinion? Golfer in the world. The guy that raised his hand. Who is it? Anybody? Spit out golfers here. Yeah. Nicholas, Palmer, who else? Watson? Uh, Longer is not bad, you know, and Craig Norman and, <laughs> and these other. You know where? You know where? Let's take uh, Arnold Palmer, okay? Uh, in his heyday. You know where he spent a lot of time? On practicing, on a practice tee. I've watched great pianists and violinists and things. They spend a lot of time practicing. Now you take Palmer, and, and he's out there on the tee. You know, early in the morning he's out on the tee. And he's got buckets full of balls. Maybe he's the finest golfer in the world. And he'll take one club, Patty, seven iron, right, for a while, and he'll hit buckets of balls. And then he'll move up maybe to the, you know, to the five iron and he hit buckets of balls. And then he'll pick up his driver, hit by hours and hours and hours of practice, goes out on the golf course, big tournament, gets out on the fairway, pulls out a four wood, and duck hooks it. Huh? Or he's within, you know, 95 yards of the hole and he, he gets out a pitching wedge, and, wedge and, and scalps it. You ever seen Palmer pick up his bag and throw him away and say, to hell with this, I ain't ever playing golf again? Why? Because golf's important to him. Excellence is important to him. When he hits a bad shot, watch him. Any good golfer will stand right in his tracks and redo that swing. You ever notice that? And that afternoon, guess where you'll find him? He'll have that club, that four wood, 
and he'll be on that practice team, and he'll work through the clubs again. You see, my point is, you want to be good at something? You want to be a good prayer? Get on the practice tee. Get on the practice tee early in the morning. Hit some buckets of balls. Because if you're like me, the way I've been with prayer is the first time I duck hook one or banana slice one, I said, to heck with this, I'm not praying anymore. Then the next emergency came, and I prayed a little more, right? And then I'd start out in a spurt, and I'd pray and meditate for a while, and then I'd back off again and spurt again and spurt, you know. Discipline. You just do it. And you just keep on doing it. And sometimes you don't know why. My sponsor, well, another first thing he told me was, ask God for help every morning and thank him every night. I didn't know why I was to do that, except that he had told me to do it, so I did it. And after about three and a half months, I realized I hadn't wanted a drink in three and a half months, and then I realized why I was doing it. Many times it happens that way. And I prayed very selfishly, and I still do at times. And that's okay. Any of y'all make out shopping lists for God? <laughs> Seriously, do, do you? Make out shopping lists for God. <coughs> Good prayers call that outlining, you know. You, you, you sit down there and you figure out what it is you need and when you need it, and you're very precise. You know, Lord, I need this by Thursday at 3.15 and this by two, that kind of thing. Who are you praying to? A clerk in the universal supermarket? Sometimes it's actually as if I believe God, you know, is a superhuman vending machine, y'all, <laughs> full of M&Ms. I don't even get upset with me about that. I just do that. I make shopping lists for God, you know. I hope he's got a sense of humor, and I think he has, because he hid himself in the last place he knew I'd ever look. I think he's got a good sense of humor. I mean that. Okay? So making out no shopping list really doesn't, uh, you know, work out too good anyway. Sometimes I've prayed for things and I've got them. Have you all ever done that? And then I don't know what the hell to do with them. You ever done that? <laughs> you all know the classic story about that, about praying for something. Be careful what you pray for because you might get it. The story of the man with the golden screw. You all ever heard that one? You haven't? Good. The guy had a golden, was born with a golden screw in his navel. And when he was a kid, he couldn't sunbathe, you know, he couldn't take his shirt off. He had to hide that golden screw, you know. And, uh, and he was tired of it. Carried it all his life, prayed all his life. Please take this golden screw away from me. Nothing happened. You know, he got ready to get married. And, uh, he said, what's my wife going to think? When I take my clothes off, she sees this golden screw. Nobody else in the world got a golden screw in their navel but me. I don't like it. So he started praying. He's praying and praying about this golden screw, and this big voice says to him, Shut up. I'm tired of hearing about that golden screw. Now I want you to go ahead and lay down on the bed, close your eyes, count to ten very quietly. Open your eyes, and this cloud's going to come floating across your bed, and on that cloud's going to be a golden screwdriver, and I want you to take that golden screw and take that golden screwdriver and take a screw out of your belly button. I want you to put them both up on that cloud, and it's going to go away, and I don't ever want to hear anything else about that golden screw. The man was just overjoyed, man. Ran into the bedroom, couldn't wait. Got real quiet, closed his eyes, counted to ten, opened them up. Here's the cloud. Golden screwdriver, he reaches up and gets it, takes out that golden screw, breathes a great sigh of relief, lays the screwdriver and the screw on the cloud. It goes away. He stood up and his ass fell off. <laughs> so we let God discipline us, it says. In a simple way, we've just outlined. Watching and praying. Be regular. Pick a time each day for an appointment with the higher power. Be serious about it. Be sincere about it. Have fun at it. Look forward to your visit. Feel free. Feel friendly. Feel loved. And pray. Because you need to. It's built into you just as deep as your cells. I believe that. You need to do it. And we jump over to the flip side, you know, it's meditation business. Well, you talk about getting bent out of shape. Now, when I got into meditation, I was a sight. I look back on me, I don't know how I stayed, you know, sober, sane, much less sober when I was doing that. 
definition of meditation, as I understand it today, is not thinking. But I didn't understand it that way when I first, I didn't understand it at all. I really thought, and I tell this, people think I'm lying, I really thought that the great meditators, right, were guys who shaved their heads. You had to be a good one. You had to do this. Shave your head, get a saffron robe and wear it, right? Sit down on the floor with your legs crossed all funny, you know, and chant on. Now, that's what I figured you had to do if you were going to meditate. And some people do it that way, and I honor that, but I didn't know what in the world I was doing. I can get into the lotus position. I cannot get out of it. Any, any of y'all have it from? You know, I drove a lot drunk, and my legs have been busted all to pieces. I can't get out of it. I get all locked in. It hurts me, too. It's uncomfortable. But I figure that's the way to do it. Couldn't find a saffron robe. Too damn vain to shave my head, right? But it would do to get all locked up in the lotus position and chant ohm. And you know what happened? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. It's embarrassing. <laughs> I figure, hell, I'll be laying on a bed of nails and a six by running over me in 10 days here, you know? If I'm going to meditate, I'm going for the top right away. Lock me up in a, you know, an airtight compartment for a couple of days. I'll show you how to slow down my breath. Hell, I'd have died to what I'd have done. I mean, we alcoholics are impatient. I am anyway. I'm going for the top. I'm going to meditate with the best of them. Move over, Guru Nanak. <laughs> here comes Tom. See, I was still insane. I hadn't had a drink for quite a while. I was still nuts. I just didn't know it. So I sat and I chanted. And nothing happened. And I got pissed. <laughs> I did. <laughs> he just wasn't coming, you know. And uh, I called a friend of mine down in Texas. He's meditating and he's showing up in his life. The guy was doing good. He's a dentist, you know. Good guy. Brilliant. I said, I'm trying to get into meditation, Harris. I said, uh, you got any books I can read? He said, yeah. He said, now I'm going to tell you what books to get. And he said, I'm going to star them. One star is very simple and five stars is very complex. So I made my list. Went to the bookstore. Guess which one I read first. <laughs> Have any of you ever read The Cloud of Unknowing? Anybody? Don't. <laughs> It was written in Middle English, right? Thee, thou, all those things. And, and it was written by a man who had spent his whole life in a monastery on top of a mountain meditating. And I'm going to do his number in two weeks. <laughs> Whew. I called Harris a couple of weeks. I said, this ain't working. He said, well, what book did you read? And I said, The Cloud of Unknowing. He said, I thought so, dummy. Don't read anymore. He said, how long you meditating? I said, an hour or two every morning. <laughs> he said, I've been doing it nine years. Longest I ever go is 15 minutes. I take Saturday and Sunday off. <laughs> See, I'm an alcoholic. I also don't know the word moderation, right? <laughs> moderation is not in my vocabulary. You know, it's full tilt all the time. All or nothing, right? Discipline and moderation. Those two words are not there, and that's what the 10th and 11th and 12th steps are all about. Discipline and moderation. I know what it was. I thought Om was a magic word. You know, it's supposed to see all kinds of visions. They talk about a third eye. I kept looking for that sucker and couldn't find it. <laughs> one of them sits on the bridge of my nose, another one sits up on my forehead. I couldn't figure out where it was. Then I got to talking to this other guy in AA. He said, the secret to it all is your sphincter muscles. Yeah. You know, if you're going to meditate right, you've got to learn to move those sphincter muscles right. This guy was far out. I mean, really. <laughs> Yeah, I sit down and drive my damn sphincter muscles, too. <laughs> Took me a long time to get into the big book about it, you know. <laughs> Things like prayer and meditation. Hell, you don't go to the big book. I talk to people about prayer and meditation. They say, where can I find a good book? Big book. And their countenance falls like shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good book. That when we awake, upon awakening, we think about the day ahead. We relax and take it easy. We ask for an intuitive thought or a decision. 
It's good stuff. It's good, lean stuff. I recommend it to beginners. I recommend it to guys who have a tendency like me to fly out on one limb on meditation and fly out on another limb. And it's like coming home to get back to page 86. Upon awakening. Do you ever daydream? Hmm? Do you ever just sit and stare off into space? Somebody comes up and says, hey, where are you? You say, huh? I didn't know. Were you thinking? <coughs> were you? Hmm. You were meditating. It is natural. It is necessary. It is not otherworldly and far out. See? I mentioned last night the guy down in Texas that taught me so much used to call me Sugar. Named Bob White. I went on a 12-step call with Bob White one day down in Whitney, Texas. We didn't do that drunk a bit of good. His ears were closed, you know. But we both stayed sober. On the way down the street and Bob was always, you know, just talking and grinning, the happiest man I ever saw. And uh, he pulls his truck beside the road, and he turns to me and gives me that grin. He said, Sugar, he says, you see that little cloud up there next to that big one? I said, yeah. He said, you think I can make that cloud go away? And I looked up to this man, and I told him so. I said, Bob, I have a lot of respect for you, but you can't make a cloud go away. And he said, you watch it. And he grinned. He sat there and looked at that cloud. Two or three minutes, that cloud was gone. I mean it. Scared the hell out of me. <laughs> it scared the hell out of me. I really. I got, you know, edging toward the door. I was getting ready to get out. And he turns at me and grins. You know? Sweetest man, too. I've I got to miss him. And he said, Sugar, you think you can do that? I said, no, nah, Bob, I ain't been sober long enough to make no cloud go away. <laughs> <laughs> Some idiotic statement like that, you know, and he grinned at it. He says, yeah, you can. They pick you a small cloud close to a big one and focus all your attention on it and will it away. I did. By God, that cloud went away. I taught my children how to do it. We was laying in the front yard, vaporizing clouds. <laughs> it's the truth. Every kid in the neighborhood come over and said, what y'all doing? Said, we vaporizing clouds. Said, what's that? Whole damn yard's full of kids and me. <laughs> but Bob taught me that. Hey, that's a wonderful thing. I dare you to think and vaporize a cloud at the same time. Meditation's purpose is to disarm the ego, put the intellect in neutral. It's idling, but it's not thinking. And all forms of meditation do this, it seems, by focusing not on the ego or the intellect, but on something else. Focusing all of your attention on one thing, on the sound. Focusing all your attention on one thing, your breath going in and out your nostrils. That's what the Buddha was doing when he was enlightened. Focusing on one thing like breathing in, Lord Jesus Christ, and breathing out, have mercy on me, as the Christian meditators did. And when your mind wanders away, as it will, that's just a signal to bring it back and watch your breathing or chant or say your mantra. You see, Bob White told me this too. He said, Sugar, used to when I'd sit down to pray, he said, the first thing that would come in my mind was a chorus line of naked women. <laughs> Any of y'all have that problem? I mean, you sit down to do something holy, you know, and something, you know, pretty but not exactly holy comes into your mind and thoughts follow. 
Any of y'all get lustful as hell? <laughs> he said, you know, I just try to run them out. I said, get off there. Get off there. Get out of here. I'm praying. I'm talking to God. You got no business dancing naked across the stage of my mind. And he said, the more I fought them, the more of them there was. Until there's so many women on the stage of my mind, I just gave up this idea of praying, went all about my business. Made me angry. He said, you want to know what to do now? I always wanted to know what he had to say. He said, I let them dance on across the stage of my mind, and when they're gone, I pray. <laughs> Spiritual teacher said it. Don't fight the evil thing. Resist not. Turn the other cheek. In AA, we say let go and let God. Live and let live. Same thing. You take your attention off those ladies, you know. They do their number and they're gone. But if you fight, they beat you. Lisa and I used to walk along the beach. Pick up pieces of ocean glass. Do you all ever do that? I mean, glass has been worked on by the ocean. God is so, it's cloudy looking, you know. And, and, and green glass is pretty common and red glass is pretty common. Every now and again you find a piece of white ocean glass, right? And uh, she found a black one one time. And these are treasures. And we walk down the beach, you know, looking for ocean glass. Can't think when you're looking for ocean glass. You're watching the sand too hard, you know. And we'd find a piece, pick it up, rub on it, say, thank you, God, put it in our pocket and keep on going. First thing you know, we'd walked a pretty good distance and hadn't thought. The Buddhist had a name for the ego. You know what they called it? The drunken monkey. The drunken monkey, the intellect. Always falling around up here, never still, always chattering, ceaselessly chattering. You give your attention to the monkey, the monkey will keep it. You take your attention from the monkey and focus on something else, you disarm the monkey. He shuts up, or you don't hear him. So we do this. Because the step says we sought through prayer and meditation. <clears throat> now, what do you do when you're sitting there watching your breath go in and out your nose, funny boy? Sometimes you feel so good you can't hardly stand it. His meditation releases endorphins. Sometimes there's nothing, it's flat. But later on in the day, you find yourself in a situation that you used to couldn't handle, and all of a sudden you handle it. <clears throat> you say to God, you know, I don't know how to handle this particular situation, but you do, and I'm going to listen while you tell me, if you will. And he tells you. What our book says is beautiful. What the AA book says about it. What used to be the occasional hunch or the inspiration gradually becomes a working part of the mind. We learn to depend on inspiration. What else happened? I sit down with people sometimes, and some of them are troubled people. And I hear me saying something to them which is so profound. Lord, it just, you know. And right away the ego jumps in and says, Remember that, Tom. That's heavy. <laughs> and I can't. You ever had that experience? It's said, it's done. It's like the channel's open. It's been done now. That's it. You can't hold it. It's not yours. Can't remember it. If you don't get anything else out of meditation except this, you sit down for 10 minutes in the morning, you pray and meditate, you focus on one thing, you know, get quiet, go down within yourself. It carries over into the day, y'all. More and more you find yourself able to focus on one thing at a time. How many of you have problems with that? What upsets me often is I'm trying to do everything at once. If I can discipline myself for 10 minutes in the morning, it carries over into the day. Yes, it does. 
and I'm able to work on one thing at a time, and I don't get so emotionally out of balance. Bill wrote that in the 12 and 12. If that's all I get out of it, that's enough. Bill says one of the first fruits of prayer and meditation is emotional balance. I believe that. But that's not all. You just know things. Never got any words, you know. But I've gotten images and symbols and pictures and people's faces. and That's something when you get a person's face. And I always call them when I'm done meditating. And they always were either thinking about me, getting ready to call me, or needed to hear from me. How do you know these things? I don't know. I'm not smart enough to know that. But God is. And so gradually, by the numbers, you know, through surrender and acceptance and inventory and confession and, and these other things, we chop away at that big eye until it becomes a little eye, an anonymous eye, an equal eye, an eye that's able to relate on a, you know, on a level with someone, an eye that loves itself because it no longer has to compare itself to other eyes. An I that is related to the higher power in a very healthy and wholesome way. The whole thing's a circle. The whole thing's a return. You grow out, you know, and then you grow back down. And the coming home part's fun. Some of us, it takes effort. Now, maybe I should say all of us. It takes a lot of effort. Okay? These steps have a lot to do with it have everything to do with it in my way of thinking. Um, I think I'm out. Is there any questions or anything? Okay. hope this has made some sense to you. hope you understand what I mean by growing down. I uh, have always believed, I knew when I heard my son say that, that it was true. I just didn't know why. And I've been trying to learn why, I guess, ever since. I agree with Eckhart that... Uh, the soul does not grow by addition, but by subtraction. And I hope you understand what he's talking about. And he's got there's a nice little book called The Meditations of Meister Eckhart. He's quite a, quite a fellow. He has some simple, good stuff. I'm going through it for the second or third time now. Still don't understand it all, but it feels good. You know what I mean? Uh, get into these maintenance steps after you finish those first nine steps. Keep yourself growing, but remember which direction you're growing in. Okay? Remember, the direction is back towards the Father, back toward home. You want to fulfill your deepest desire. That is the direction I believe that you must go. And that's what this program is all about. Any questions? I wanted to say, too, if there are any of you that want those tapes and you do just don't have the money, maybe you're newly sober or something like that, just see Lisa or me or Jerry. It's no big deal. Okay? Anything like that. Any any other questions or questions at all? Okay. I've either put you to sleep or we've had a good day. And I feel pretty good. Eat my stomach. <laughs>